Folks, welcome to an all new episode of So Bad It's Good with Ryan Bailey. This is your pal Ryan, and this should be your Saturday episode. I'm coming to you on Saturday afternoon in beautiful, very hot Gilbert, Arizona. I'm here at my dad's place, and I've been here for a couple of days, and I'm sorry this wasn't out earlier. This is going to be an OC recap, but we're going to talk about a couple of other things before that. Uh, because that's what we just do on this podcast. We talk about everything for a very, very long time. So strap in, get a beverage, relax. Uh, yeah, let's 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 have some fun. I hope you guys are. Are you guys doing good? How's the weekend treating you so far? I hope it's good. I hope it's not nearly as hot wherever you are. I'm just, as always, when I come to Arizona, just sitting in my sweat. Yeah, think about that. It's such. Think about it. It's attractive to think about that. It's it's a fun thought. Um, but I hope you guys are doing great. Maybe I'll get my dad to come in and say hi at some point. Um, so let's see. This last couple of days have been a whirlwind. Let me take you through that. I came into town. I did that Jeff Lewis live show at Stand Up Live downtown Phoenix on Thursday night. And that was a blast. If there are any chumps listening or anybody that was actually there, uh, we had one of the Patreon members that was there and that was awesome. I think her name's Rachel. It was awesome to meet her. Um, I got to meet so many people. It's so cool to go outside and, and I, I mean, it's, it's great to go outside in the first place, but it's so awesome to meet people in the real world because you know, you're stuck behind a micro, not stuck. I choose to be behind a microphone. So it's really, really, ex it's, it's really great to go out there and like meet the people that listen or, you know, they're, I mean, they all listen to Jeff. There's 550 people there. It was sold out and it was just so cool. His fan base is so awesome. So supportive. I met so many just great people. I, I laughed so much. It was a really, really great special night. Um, a lot of man, Jeff, Jeff just cracks me up, man. He's, he's so calm. We were in the green room before the show and he's just so that he's just there looking at Instagram, just really chill. And I'm like, how are you chill? I get nervous if I do anything. And, uh, he's just so great. Everybody, Doug, Jameson, Carney, um, uh, Joey Zauzig, Patrick and Pole, um, Shane, it's just a, it's a fun group of people, but just the audience is what makes it. I mean, and you guys listening, you are what makes this show. It really, really is so gratifying when you get to hear people and talk to them and, and meet them in real life. It's not nearly as scary as I sometimes feel it will be. So it was such a just great experience. So thank you if you were a part of that or if I got to meet you. It was just so cool. Really a night I will remember forever. So that was awesome. And then I got to spend time with, it has been really nice. It's just been a couple of days. But um, yesterday I did a podcast, which by the way, I want to tell you about this. I did two podcasts in the last day that, that are not my own, but I want to promote these podcasts. Um, one was... Let me pull this up, you guys. Very organized over here, as always. Uh, it's called Hi, Felicia with Marnie and Felicia. And it's a mom and daughter. And I got to talk to them about Bravo, pop culture, how I got my start. And I think it's a relatively new podcast, but it's something that you might want to check out. They were so great. And listen, you know from you know me having mom on uh, my mom on this podcast so much, I just it was just so great to you know, talk to a mom and daughter that are doing this. And uh, I just had a blast. So go check out that podcast and always remember rate podcasts and especially newer ones, five stars so they can get some more attention and then get better placement on Spotify or Apple podcasts. And, and that's something how it keeps this industry going. Like the more, the merrier in terms of podcasts, like we, there's a place for all of us here. And I think that's like the really exciting thing about working on podcasts is that, you know, there are so many, there's so many chance. Everybody has a chance. There's, there's, there's room for everybody. There's room for everybody's voice. And that's, what's so exciting. And like, I always say, even if we disagree on housewives, even if today we start talking about OC and you're a huge Tamra fan, or you're a huge Alexis Bellino fan. And currently as of this episode, I am not, but we can still be okay with each other. We can still be okay. We can still disagree with each other, but hopefully we can all come together to agree that John Jansen is a horrible person. This is not Real Housewives of John Jansen. It's Real Housewives of Orange County, damn it. I did not sign up to watch an infomercial about the, the wonderment of John Jansen. I don't care if this guy's dick is just solid gold. I am not needing this in my life. I do not need to know 
how good John Jansen's in bed. I don't need to know how he, you know his career and life got ruined. If your career and life got ruined, maybe don't date somebody that's on the same damn show. Maybe go lay low because I will not be searching you out. I am forced to, I feel like I'm getting waterboarded by John Jansen information. I don't want to hear this. I'd rather hear about the ladies' lives, but we'll get into that. Anywho, I did that podcast. I also got to go back on um, Is This Real Life? Mandy Slutzer's podcast. And she's been doing it even before I was doing a podcast. I don't even remember the last time I was on Mandy's podcast, but she's always so amazing to talk to. We just had the best conversation. We got in even talking about our families. It was so great. So that's going to be out on Sunday, I believe. So check that out as well um, and just support her and her podcast. Um, so yesterday I was going, I did that first podcast with Marnie and Felicia, and then I had some microphone issues. So I use this like really nice sure microphone, but you have to plug it into this, um, this kind of adapter because it, I don't want to get technical and I don't necessarily understand it myself, but it's such a high voltage that you have to have another adapter piece to plug the mic in. So it doesn't blow your entire system. And for some reason, the piece just stopped working yesterday. And I was freaking out because I was like, oh my God, I don't have a backup mic. I don't have anything here. So I ordered that piece on Amazon and luckily they did like, like less than 24 hour delivery. So I have a new piece. So I'm ready to pod with an actual microphone again. So hopefully this is sounding okay. Um, I really hope double cross, right? Um, so, but then I think it was Sandra and Medici I was talking. Uh, texting with and Sandra was like, you know what? Maybe it's just a sign to go hang out with your family. And I was like, yeah, they, I'll take it as a sign. So I took my dad and we went to our friends, Matt, Matt and Jessica, and I officiated their wedding years ago. And I mentioned them before because their baby Bodie um, was born premature about 10 months ago. And you guys, Bodie was born two pounds, eight ounces two pounds, a, I burp like a two pound, eight ounce burp. Like this baby was so premature and was in the NICU for months. And I got to visit Bodhi about 10 months ago when he was born. And it was just, I mean, the tiniest in the NICU ward. And it was really scary, right? Imagine being a new parent. They've never had a kid before. And then this happens, you know, being born so early. And I am so proud. This kid now, 10 months later, we got a 20, we got a chunker on our hands. This kid, kid's 20 pounds almost. And just the cutest baby. And I got to go hang out with them and my dad and uh, Jessica cooked for, my dad got a home cooked meal because I'm telling, I'm telling you, it's like, it's like Lord of the flies over here. My dad literally just his, his refrigerator just is just factor meals and candy. <laughs> and, and you know, I'm a glass half empty kind of guy and everything makes me sad. So it has been interesting to be here because there's so much happiness, you know, mixed with the sadness, but you know, like some of this is like a museum to my mom and there's so many memories that come back because we're nearing the year anniversary of her, her passing. And I just, there's so many bad memories with that last month, especially. And, uh, it's been so exciting and, and really awesome to see dad, like, you know, like the little ways he's kind of making this house his own now. He's put up a lot of posters of his favorite rock band. No, nothing like that, but just like little changes. He got like new patio furniture and you, you really root for him. I'm like really rooting for my dad. Um, but it was so funny. I opened the fridge and my mom used to have the fridge stocked and I'm not saying like, Oh my God, I needed food from the fridge, but it was just one of the, you know, those things that you're, if you're lucky to have parents that are still around or that you really get along with, you know, you go to your parents' place and it's always like, you know, you, you open the fridge, you see all these like condiments and these certain things. And it's just totally different. And it's just like, oh, my dad's like, oh, I don't really like cooking. And, and, you know, it's just easy to do the factor meals. And then he has like just bags of candy. And I'm like, oh, it's totally healthy, dad. He's like a 16-year-old boy. Um, but there was something that made me really sad. Like I, I started tearing up. I was like, oh, just by opening a fridge. Can you imagine? I was like, <laughs> mom would have had, it would have been complete. We would have had like five different types of mustards and like every salad dressing known to man. But things change, you know? Anyways, we were over at Matt and Jessica's. They cooked this amazing meal. And then we even stayed the night over there because um, we had a couple glasses of wine. And they said, why don't, you, why don't you just stay the night? And we're like, yeah, well, let's do that. And then we woke up, had a really nice breakfast, came back to Gilbert, and I started podcasting. But I will say, like, I needed this, man. Like, I needed just to talk to um, my my friends, friends that have known me for so long. And it was so great to catch up with them and 
see their baby and see how, you know, even through tragedy or even the baby being born premature, where they are now and how beautiful that baby is. And it's just so, I always forget because I, I, you know, you guys know I'll like hide myself away or I don't really keep in touch with people. I'm really bad at like stuff like that. Um, but it was just, it was really nice. I needed that. It just really energized me and like really reminded me of what my focus, you know, like you gotta, you gotta have those real moments in life. I gotta allow myself to have those real moments and to work on relationships and friendships and things that I always forget. And that it's, you know, it's really beautiful. It's not scary. Like I always sometimes think it will be, it's just, it was really, really nice. I don't know if any of this makes sense. I'm oversharing as I usually do. Um, so it was just, it was great. It was great. And, uh, yeah, let's see. Well, okay. I lost my train of thought. Here we go. Uh, there has been a lot of news in the last couple of days before we get to the OC. And I wanted to mention two things in particular, even though we'll talk a lot of this and other things on the pop culture roundup on Monday's episode. But, um, there were two things that stood out is that yesterday, Friday, we got the news that Miss Nastasia Schroeder, Stasi Schroeder, is coming back to television, folks. Was everybody surprised at that? We got hit with this news on a Friday. And by the way, I think this news should have dropped on a Tuesday. Like, I don't know. It was weird. Like, I couldn't really gauge. I couldn't trying to gauge people's reaction to the news. Like, if it was like overall excitement, if people were like, uh, like, I don't know. Like, I felt like it. I felt like people should have been talking about it more. Maybe people are talking about it tons and I've just been a little checked out. Um, so we've got this news that was announced yesterday with a Vanderpump Villa, the show that's on Hulu. It's had one season so far. And Lisa Vanderpump's like, uh, well, we're working hard to work on season two, Nick Lane. And I think that maybe uh, somebody needs to help. What do you think? And then they pan over and Stassi's there and, you know, doing her little Stassi thing. And they announced that Stassi is coming to Hulu on the second season of Vanderpump Villa. Now, I covered a little, I had a couple of the cast members from Vanderpump Villa on So Bad It's Good throughout the first season. And not a lot of people, I don't think, watch that season, but it shows you that Hulu really believes in Vanderpump Villa. They didn't cancel it, and they've added Stassi to it. They brought in a big gun. And a lot of people have been wondering and curious when Stassi was going to come back to television. Well, now we've got our answer. It's going to be Vanderpump Villa. And there's a second show she's going to be doing for Hulu as well, which I found very interesting. And if you look at the mechanics of the deal, my guess is that they, well, this is just an uninformed guess, so it could be completely wrong. But I think they probably, you know, were in negotiations with Stassi to do a show and to guarantee that show that she's going to lead by herself, they said, okay, we'll totally do this if you participate in the second season of Vanderpump Villa. And that way they can use the popularity of Stasi to kind of launch that show, which really, like I said, I don't think nearly enough people watched. It's, you know, it's, it's okay. It's like, it's below deck, it, it below deck ish, you know, like Lisa was welcoming people to her villa. And, you know, throwing events for people. And then the people that work for her were getting into all sorts of drama and romance and all of this stuff. So I don't necessarily know how Stasi's going to fit in to this show. Like, I can guess. I can guess that I bet Stasi's going to help plan. You know, it's going to go from Stasi's like, it's my birthday, to actually planning people's birthday. Uh, birthday. So I feel... Because th wasn't that one of her gigs on one of the last seasons of Vanderpump Rules where she was helping plan events for Lisa? So I believe that's what it's going to be for Vanderpump Villa. That's going to be the connecting tissue. Now, I know Stassi was overseas with her family, which I'm curious if that means they just shot Vanderpump Villa. So they've just shot that the, the entire season already or if they're gearing up to shoot. But obviously she was filming with Lisa for that little Vanderpump Villa tease that we saw on Friday. Um, I'll find out more information, but that's my guess is that she's going on there um, as somebody that's going to be planning events and then she'll deal with the staff and probably get into it with them. And, you know, like classic Stasi stuff, take a Pinot Grigio, that kind of thing. Um, and I don't know, what do people feel about that? Are people excited about this? I mean, I know Stasi has remained incredibly popular 
Um, even though she did get fired from Vanderpump Rules, just like Kristen Doty did. Now, Kristen Doty made her way back to the Valley, and now Stassi is doing this. But this is not NBC Universal. This is Hulu, and Hulu also owns ABC, Disney. So it is not affiliated with Bravo and NBC Universal, which is also another little interesting tidbit. And I wonder if there was any inroads by Bravo to try to get Stassi back on their network before Hulu jumped in. Like, I'm not sure exactly how that all went down, but it's a really smart move in some ways for Stassi because she didn't have to go to the Valley and she doesn't have to go back to Vanderpump Rules, which is a pit of vipers. It is a toxic situation, which makes her a good reality TV. But Stassi has almost presented her life now of moving past Vanderpump Rules, moving past these things. So now there'll be that tertiary connection with Lisa Vanderpump which, you know, obviously they've had their relationship up and ups and downs throughout the years that they work together. But it is interesting that Lisa now is using Stasi to try to elevate her show in a second season. Uh, I think it's a really smart move. I'm curious how they will execute it. And I wonder a lot of things. I wonder if Stasi was nervous. I wonder if she is nervous coming back. I mean, this is a lot of this is big moves. These are big, big moves. And will audiences still be there for Stasi? Will they have forgiven her for her past transgressions? I mean, we do all move on at a certain point. I mean, will those transgressions be talked about? I mean, I don't think they necessarily will because I don't know how that would come up in Vanderpump Villa. But um, it'll be interesting to see how audiences respond to that. And if we come flocking towards it, you know, it'll be, it, it, I'm really curious. Like, will it involve her family life at all? There are a lot of questions I have in the execution of all of this. So let me know, are you guys excited? Are you here for it? I'm just curious how they all do this. Now, the second part of this though, which I think is interesting is we have that, but we also have a docu comedy series called Stasi says, and that's in the works at Hulu. So this is part of that deal. And it is produced by Aaron Foy and Jenna Rosenfeld. And Aaron Foy has worked with Stasi before on Bravo shows. Um, and it says, the quote is, endlessly relatable, utterly hysterical, and questionably sane. Stasi is the anchor of a fresh ensemble of comedic and chaotic characters who are dealing with identity crises and major life crossroads of their own. And Stasi's the one who has to keep them all afloat. And that's the official log line of the series. And even reading that log line, I still don't necessarily know what this is about. Does it mean she's anchoring a fresh ensemble of comedic and chaotic characters? So what does that mean? Does that mean they're her friends? Does that mean it's like her helping people with identity crisis? I, I, I'm, I'm curious. It's one of those things where I'm like, okay, I still don't necessarily know what this means. So I'm curious what this, this all means how this all fits into everything. Cause the log line didn't really make tons of sense to me, but it's called Stassi says, so she is anchoring and leading that entire show. And I'm curious how much of her real life gets on that show as well. I mean, Stassi has said, I believe on her podcast or, or, you know, ever since being fired from Vanderpump rules that, yeah, like it's great to not be a part of the toxicity. It was great to not be a part of Scandal. But we do know Scandal sells. We do know toxicity sells. Even on this week's Orange County, toxic as hell. But we're all talking about it. That's how these shows keep going. So how do you make a reality show that's entertaining to watch without toxicity? Or do you accept that reality shows need toxicity and find a way to manufacture that or try to make it in a somewhat realistic tone? Does Stasi still have the juice because her actual life seems not chaotic? It seems like she's got a nice family. She's got two kids. She's got both. She's got a nice house. You know, like it seems like her life is pretty cool. You know, it's a pretty good life. So why then throw reality television back into the mix? You know, so it is smart that she's not on Vanderpump Rules. She doesn't have to deal with those old relationships. So I'm really curious. I'm curious to see how all this pans out, but huge news on the Saucy front on Friday. And I do want, and if anybody can tell me, anybody out there that might know the scoop, was there any inroads to try to get her back to Vanderpump Rules? Because I think I said that last year. I said, well, wouldn't it be interesting if they finally got Stasi back, if they're worried about getting Ariana and Tom back? What if they got somebody like her back? And that could guarantee that, you know, a 12th season, there'd be some different or more different or interesting things to tackle because we would have Stasi coming back in and dealing with that. Because come on, part of us does want to see Stasi hand Tom Sandoval his ass. 
Come on. Like, dude, Stassi, I don't need to hear from you, dude. You know how Sandoval just got rattled by Stassi all the time? Like, imagine that. Like, I did not come here, dude. Because I would, like, I, I have to say, I would have loved, I would have loved to have seen Stassi last season. You know, because we saw Lala and Sheena kind of try to be more understanding of Tom Sandoval and the journey and the healing journey that he was on last season. You know, we watched Lala go into his Tom's scream therapy appointment. Ah! And like, what's up, Lala? What's up, dude? Hey, can we talk brother to the brother, dude? I would have loved to have seen that because my bet would be that Stassi would not give him the time of day and really rail him for all of his past transgressions. And I think that would have potentially been entertaining to see. And I think it probably also would have been highly toxic for Stassi and probably not good for her mental health. So kudos for her for potentially not doing it if it was offered to her, but also bummer for the audience because that would have been potentially enjoyable to see. Now, also, at this point, I've been screaming this for the last month on this show. If you listen or daily listener, I said, guys, I think at this point we have to accept that Sheena and Lala ha- are pretty much more than... I mean, they're not friends of on the Valley. I think they have full positions on the Valley. I am seeing them at photographed at every event that the Valley has. And I think at this point, I know uh, the producer of the Valley, who also produced Vanderpump Rules, produces OC, Alex Baskin. He said that they were going to use them sparingly, that it would just be guest appearances. But I don't know, man. I see Sheena at all these events. I see they just did the Miss USA thing with Lala. Part of me thinks they're filming all this stuff. I saw, and and Sheena really is really, you got to give Sheena credit. She's really good at getting in there. I have told you before that at times on Vanderpump Rules, she was not given a full season contract and she was given a day player contract, which means you would get paid for showing up like, you know, for the days that you did film or like events you did show up to, you would get paid for that day, but you wouldn't get paid as a series regular. And that was never like, I don't think like headline news. I don't think that was out in the ether or the public. But Sheena, in those situations, you would always find she would be like, she would be in there. She would make sure that she was involved in those storylines. I think she's really good at that. So I do wonder if it's a similar situation and then Sheena just makes sure she's at every event that the Valley's at. I don't know how it all works. Sheena, if you're listening, if this gets back to you, let us know how it works. But I think at this point, the cat's slowly coming out of the bag because there's just no way we're only going to see Sheena and Lala two times on the Valley. I think we're going to see him a lot on the Valley, a lot on the Valley, which I'm really curious about. And who knows? I mean, like I know our tendency is to shit on everything. I know. And by the way, I've said, I didn't think, and I think Sheena even said that the Valley didn't need her and the Valley didn't need Lala, but it's one thing to say it. And then, you know, the reality of a situation can sometimes be completely different. So maybe we shouldn't completely shit on that. Even if it's bums us out to hear it, We shouldn't shit on it. Maybe it's going to be amazing. Maybe it's going to make it great. Maybe you're going to have Sheena coming at Jax. You're going to have Lala coming at Jax. Who knows? But I'm very curious. But it also kind of makes sense in a certain way because if Vanderpump Rules is up in the air in terms of the start date for season 12, they would have already been filming this 12th season if it was a normal season of Vanderpump Rules, but it is on pause right now. So yeah, Sheena wants to get her bag. She wants to continue to be on TV. That's what all these, these people want to be reality stars. They want to be in the public eye. That's the whole bit. So of course, I think they would want to be in the Valley or on the Valley. Even if they say no, it's a way to get them to work. And also I think if it's Alex Baskin and producer Jeremiah from Vanderpump Rules, it's potentially a way to keep Lala and Sheena happy while they do have to wait, because I think they do depend on this. And I, you know, I've always said, I don't want to worry about reality stars and where they get their paychecks. Maybe this shouldn't be a job that you do until you're in your seventies. Like this shouldn't, we shouldn't have people being on TV on a reality show for upwards of 15 seasons. It should, it's probably not healthy, but at the same time, if you're those people, you damn well want to find your next gig. That's the whole bit. So you can't blame them for wanting to be on this show, but if they find a good organic way to do that, and I will say Sheena has relationships with all these people, it could be interesting. We'll, we'll see. But I think at this point we have to just accept it because it looks like it's happening. I mean, you, you're, you'd be an idiot to not see all this and go put two and two together. Like it's not just by happenstance that Sheena is literally showing up to every event where the Valley has cameras. Like that's got to be something that's got to be scheduled. So 
that's just a thought I wanted to throw out there. One last thing, just 25 minutes into this show, is that last night I'm hanging with my family and uh, <laughs> I get uh, my phone starts blowing up because Jack, there was Jack breaking Jack's Taylor news. And I'm like, oh man, sometimes you just want to have a night. You want to have a night. And but I should have just like thrown my phone away last night. But I see this is that Brittany, Brittany Cartwright Taylor, um, posted a thing of Jack's and talking about his cam, like talking about Jack's on cameo. Cause Jack's, you know, he takes his cameo very seriously. Right. So last night, Brittany posted this, I believe in her story stories. I'm going to try to find this and play you the audio from this just so we can be on the same page about what happened. On okay. So this is from, uh, one of my favorite Instagram accounts by wig. Hello drama. And I will say, and I used to be in the thick of all of this on my Instagram. And I just, I think this year with mom passing all that, I just really haven't found a lot of things funny or interesting. And I save it all for the podcast. Like, you know, I put, I, you know, I put my whole bussy into this, you know what I'm saying? And so sometimes like, I, you know, I wasn't rushing to make Jack's memes last night. Um, and I think in the old days I would have, I don't know if I'm becoming softer or more a pussy or whatever, but I think it's interesting to talk about. So it's from this Instagram account by wig. Hello drama. You're going to hear the audio of Jax's cameo. And then we're going to talk about it afterwards. So this was up on his cameo as an introductory message for people potentially wanting a cameo from Mr. Jax Taylor. Here we go. Kent doesn't have any. Oh, here we go. Sorry. 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 Taylor from Vanderpump Rules. I am now on Cameo, so hit me up. Uh, I'd love to help you guys out. And also, you're helping me out because I'll be donating my money to cancer research, actually esophageal cancer, because obviously that is near and dear to my heart. So hit me up. I'd love to shoot you a message. Have a great day, guys. Have a great day, guys. <laughs> hey, have a great day. Hey, it's friendly, Jax. It's very, hey, hey, we're all just friends here. It's me, Jax. So I believe his dad passed away from esophageal cancer, so that's very believable, right? Very believable that Jack's that is a matter that is very close to his heart. Totally believable. But what then happened was Brittany, I think, posted this on her stories or on her Instagram. She's since deleted this, but she wrote, just realized Jax has this on his cameo, and it's disgusting because he has never never donated a dime. FYI at cameo. And she tagged cameo to say that Jax is lying. And I gotta tell you right off the bat. You're telling me Jax Taylor lied? That that's got to be a first. I've never that is shocking to me. But uh, no, it's not shocking to me at all. They, this is obviously so. Brittany is saying he has never donated a dime from his cameo to any kind of cancer charity. So you're like, holy shit, that is dark. That is so damn dark. Oh no. And. But then it's equally dark that Brittany is busting this dude out on her social media saying that Mr. Taylor's lying. Now, we thought that Mr. Taylor was in a mental health facility, and I heard that to be true. But everybody says he keeps posting. He keeps doing this. So it's a place where you have your phone potentially. I don't know. I'm trying to find out more information. So I'll let you know as soon as I, I do. But Obviously, him and Brittany are definitely not in a good place because Brittany also, I thought, wasn't she like, well, I want to make sure Cruz, I want to never embarrass her dad. And she's always been so ride or die Team Jax, right? So it seems like probably what my guess is Brittany found new information about maybe Jax's exploits and was livid. But this is really dangerous, man, to throw this out there. I mean, this this is a financial impropriety, right? Like, is there any kind of legality? I don't know. Talk to the Bravo docket or something. But uh, is there a, a kind of a legality to say that you're going to be donating money to cancer research and then actually not doing that? And people are potentially getting cameos for you to help a good cause like that is dark. It's also dark that Brittany revealed that information because Brittany just didn't find that out. She had to have known for years that Jax has not donated any of this money. So, you know, listen. Brittany's probably known this for years and is now just saying this now. So in some ways, it kind of makes her an accomplice in some ways. I love Jax, though. It's just classic Jax. It's like, it's, oh, we're going to donate all proceeds to cancer research. Like It's like, we're going to donate all uh, proceeds to butt cancer. Hey, hey, this is Jax Taylor. Hey, you guys, I love to chat. I'm a real friendly guy. I just played a character on a show. I'm not evil at all. Uh, we're going to be donating all proceeds to uh to uh 
ah, shit, to urethra cancer. Urethra cancer is where we're going to be doing it. Uh, toe cancer, we're going to we're gonna put a lot of these proceeds to eyeball cancer, nose cancer, a lot of just the cancers. A lot of that really try. We're going to solve cancers with Jack Saylor's cameo. So please, love to talk to you. It's a bottom barrel price at 150 bucks, going straight to toe cancer. Let's do this, folks. Anyway, she's deleted, thus deleted, a dirty delete, I guess, and we'll find out what happens. But whoo, it's one of those things that it's not surprising at all. It's surprising that Britney came out of this, knowing the mental health facility and knowing that they're filming the Valley season two. Like, are we going to get a Jax faking uh, cancer donations uh, storyline on the Valley season two? I mean, this is, I'm telling you, I've told you, pit of vipers, pit of vipers. You know, it's that thing when you watch the soap opera as a kid and you didn't understand because you're like, uh, it seems like the place that they live, just bad things keep happening. Like, why don't you move out of Port Charles? Like, you know, you're like, why don't the people on this soap opera realize that really bad things happen in this town and they should move? And it's the same thing sometimes with the Valley and Vanderpump rules and maybe, you know, the Orange County and all of the housewives. Why don't you move away? But they can't because they are shackled to these shows and they depend on it for their livelihood. And it's insane. They're stuck in this pit of despair, but they're making good money. And I just think it is so dark and dangerous when you think about the reality. When you think about it's probably the best year for Britney and Jax in terms of their finances. They're actually having a lot of money coming in, but at what cost? Their family is kind of close to being destroyed, if not already destroyed. We have now people releasing information about Jax like they have all along. It seems like everything is ramped up. I mean, it's just really dark stuff. And that's the dark side of reality television. For all of this celebrity, for all of this eyeballs on them, it's this darkness where they leverage everything that actually is real. And it was like last night I was with my friends, Matt and Jessica, and my dad, and I was like, this is real. I've got to remember this when I'm in my, on my fat podcaster ass talking about all these shows and I leave with this bad feeling at the end of the night or whenever I finish because I've just talked about really dark shit and just, you know, uh, conflict, conflict, conflict and very little resolution. And then you go and you're like, oh, well, real life is these friends and real life is my dad and real life is Rebecca and real life is like, they're, they're, you know, and, and I have to remind myself of this because you can get like, you can get in it, man. It's like a tornado of darkness. And some of it's funny. Like there's a dark comedy element and aspect to all of this. Like even on today's OC, I mean, dark comedy, but it gets you angry because you're like, Tamara, it's not a friend. You don't know the definition of a friendship when it comes to reality television. Tamara might know how to be a great friend in real life to people that are not on television, but on television, like I've always said, Tamara's best friend is the show itself. She's loyal to that show. I think sometimes she makes the wrong moves in thinking she's helping the show, but she's loyal to that show. She would never double cross the show, but my God, she would double cross anybody else that she says she's friends with on that show. And that's why she's an infuriating yet necessary character to watch. Camera is necessary on OC, even when she makes the extremely wrong moves, because you need that person that makes the wrong move, that doubles down, that their ego is so big that they really can't see that they're in the wrong, or maybe they know they're in the wrong, but they're going, we're giving you the razzle dazzle. This is good TV. And sometimes you're like, man, I would rather see just somebody go, I am your friend. I realize you fucked up and I'm going to love you even harder because I know you need it instead of. You're a fucking alcoholic. Well, you know, and she says that with an actual espresso martini in her hand. By the way, in that dinner scene on OC, Tamara looked like she was like, she looked like she was toasted. I mean, like how many drinks have you had, Tamara? But that's the deal. Like I'm enraged and these shows are supposed to get us enraged. These are our gladiators. This is our sport. I don't watch sports, but I think this is our sport. You know what I'm saying? But man, when you really think about it, how do these people all not have ulcers? How do they, how are they, how are they not just, how do they live? How do they live? And how much money, do you ever ask yourself this? How much money would it take for you guys to completely destroy your lives? What is it? Like, what's the, what's the dollar amount that you're like, okay, yeah, I pretty much lost a lot of my family and friends, but huh, I can live in a pretty good modern day farmhouse. Yeah. A lot of, this money can buy a lot of mamas beer cheese. You know what I'm saying? So anyways, that's the Vanderpump News. 
Let's get into Real Housewives of Orange County, even though we've mentioned it a couple of times. Um, so this week's episode, episode five, season 18, it is called Dinner Party Disaster. Now, even with that title, you know, hey, disaster, strong word. I'm always there for a disaster. I love dinner, love to eat dinner, like parties, don't love them, but like them. So Dinner Party Disaster, three very powerful words put together. So I was like, we're in for a special treat. And we kind of were and we kind of weren't. Um, the description that Peacock gives us in their description is very simple. It just says, the Trace Amigas come together for the first time. And I was like, ooh. What? I was like, is this like an origin story? Are we doing a flashback to when these ladies met? But no, they just mean that Vicky, Tamara, and Shannon are all in the same room. But that would have been great if they did a flashback and they hired actors to portray young Shannon, young Vicky, and young Tamara. Um, and obviously this is a nod to the trace of me. They, God, they make it like the trace amigas were the Beatles or something <laughs> like, like that, that they were selling out like, Hey, the trace amigas are doing three weeks at the sphere. They make it like, it's like this huge, like and the trace amigas did a handful of shows. Like, by the way, when I saw the trace amigas, they, you know, it's like, Oh, it's silly. And I just always well, saw clips and I'm like, Oh, they're just drinking on stage and being goofy. And if that floats your boat, great, go see them live. In fact, the Jeff Lewis live show was held at the place where they did the last Trace Amiga show. And Doug Buden, who hosts the Shannon and Vicky live show now, he was also hosting that show that night. And it was the last time. Tamara, in fact, told them at dinner that she was not going to be continuing on, Doug said. And I thought that was fascinating. Like, those are the scenes that I wish they were filming of these behind the scenes conversations. Um, but Tamara left the Trace Amigas. And now it's just Dos Amigas E. Doug. Shannon and Vicky. And Tamara is still holding to this, I can't watch Shannon destroy herself, an alcoholic. And I think two things obviously can be true at once, but I also think that is somebody trying to make wild excuses, trying to make themselves look like they have a higher, the higher moral ground when they don't. And also trying to act like it's true concern for a friend watching them go through something when I'm sorry, you're never going to get me to believe that this is the way to go for a true friendship, that this is that the way Tamara's handling this is the way to go. I mean, it really enrages me because also if you chose to do this, I know definitely not the way to go is Tamara then sitting down and within a second at dinner going, you're a alcoholic. You don't do that. You don't stop somebody when you're down. But I believe that Tamara thinks she's way above Shannon. And that's why she has then enforced us, enforced Shannon to be the underdog. She has made Shannon stronger. This is a housewife trope that it seems like some of the smartest housewives that play the housewife game don't understand. When you come this hard down on somebody, you would actually make a lighter argument, uh, another example of like Janet and Dodie this past season. When you exclude somebody, when you come down on somebody, when you try to potentially mess with somebody, the audience will then kind of immediately be more open to relating and empathizing with the underdog. And that is why it's all made Shannon stronger because you see, she's having to deal with Tamrat. She's having to deal with Alexis Bellino talking about John Jansen's gold dong every five minutes. Those things make us empathize more with Shannon because Shannon is a flawed character. And she will tell you that she will admit to you that she is somebody that wakes up and there is probably drama a lot of the times. And she said in a flashback this episode, that's just me. That's just me. Some of those, it's just us. Some people are just wired that way. And guess what? If you are a friend of that person, you got to be a real friend and go, I understand. And, you know, you can secretly think, well, God, thank God I'm not wired that way. Thank God I don't wake up and it's drama every day. But when somebody comes that hard against somebody that they call a friend, it becomes really disingenuous and it becomes then like Tamara's using somebody and using a friendship and using information instead of ever helping. There's no loyalty there. Friendship, part of friendship is loyalty. And there is sometimes it feels like there's none. Now I will say, I do not know Tamara Barney judge in real life. I do suspect that she's potentially different in real life. And I do suspect that she has a very good life outside of the show that we don't know about. I think she thinks she knows how to play the housewives game and she does in a lot of ways, but she has a podcast, a very successful podcast where she talks about the behavior of all these different housewives franchises and the women on them. She knows the game, but sometimes I really don't like the characters that talk about it or think about it like a game. This is supposed to be a reality show. This is not a competition reality show. 
She is not on Survivor. She is not on Traders. She is on Real Housewives of Orange County. And sometimes I think she thinks it's a competition show. And I don't sometimes like the characters that treat it like that or treat it as such. I feel like it's a disservice to their actual stories. And sometimes it's enjoyable, but when you hit that same button again and again and again, it's like Lisa Rinna in the later seasons of Beverly Hills. It becomes such a caricature of yourself that it becomes so unreal and disingenuous that it turns you off. Tamara doesn't do herself any favors, but maybe in a sense, she's thinking she's doing the show a favor. Maybe she thinks, like I said, razzle dazzle, we're making it interesting for the audience. And in a sense, maybe we're arguing about it. I'm talking about it. We're, we're amped up about it. But I also think there's a happy medium, right? And her all of a sudden being such good friends with Alexis, Lexi Bellino, when we saw how their relationship was the first time Alexis was on, we always forget the history of these shows. These shows have been on so long that we sometimes forget. And they're like, no, no, we're great. Oh, we respect each other. But I will say, if Alexis makes it to a second season, and I don't think production has really set her up to have a second season at this point, but you never know. But if there is, Tamara will eventually come against Alexis again. There is no loyalty with Tamara, it feels like. So I don't know. Those are just some opening thoughts. I, you know, like I said, you guys might feel completely different than me and that's okay. But we, we can all agree. Like I said, John Jansen, bad. That's that we can all agree on. Okay. So let's, so we start every week, as we always do, with scenes uh, from the previous episodes. And last week's episode was all about Katie potentially coming for Heather because she heard from her paparazzi friend that is in charge of all the paparazzi, the king of paparazzi, that Heather Debro potentially called paparazzi to take photos of her and Terry Debro, uh, Sir Terry Debro, at Disneyland. And I will say, what's so interesting or or interesting about this rumor or this accusation is because a little piece of us all think that this potentially could be true. Like I've always said, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I actually expect most of the housewives to exhibit this type of behavior. And I don't know. I just didn't really care one way or the other, but it really activated Heather with Heather. Heather was like, I am not lying. I swear on the lives of my 30 children that that is not true and really got activated, stood up for herself, said, no, I have never been in contact with the paparazzi. I've never texted the paparazzi, but I was like, well, have you DM'd or have you, I mean, there's other communication ways. Who knows? I mean, maybe Terry called the paparazzi and is not telling Heather. Now, I really thought that there's uh, that, 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 that she did call. Now, I've been told recently, and even uh, Jeff Lewis was talking about this and said, hey, he's been to Disneyland and he had paparazzi pictures of him from Disneyland. And he definitely didn't call them. And he said, one time I looked great, one time I didn't. And I thought that was amazing. He actually did a really good interview on Dumois' podcast, uh, Do You. And uh, you guys should check it out if you're interested in Jeff. I thought it was like one of the best interviews he's done. Uh, do really knock that episode out of the park. But, uh, it, you know, it did make me rethink. He's like, yeah, there is a guy that actually does hang out at Disneyland just to get celebrities. So maybe there's a world in which there's a paparazzi guy there and they just have, but I will say it looks like they see the paparazzi. So maybe there's a world in which they didn't call, but they saw the paparazzi there and they kind of did a fake prom pose knowing that they were being photographed. I mean, and all the, like, listen, the reason why this rumor kind of works and you kind of believe it is because Heather, you know, Heather likes to be noticed. Heather likes to be recognized. Heather likes to be a celebrity. And there's nothing wrong with that. Like, that's what part, that's why she's Miss Fancy Pants. It's what, one of the reasons, but she's not the only housewife. A lot of them enjoy that. A lot of them. And Terry even admits in this episode, well, I kind of like having my picture taken. We know, Terry, we know. So that was a big storyline. Also, they're really coming down on Katie for potentially, and I've heard this and I disagree with it uh, uh, very much, is that they're trying to say she's like Anne, Anne Marie from Real Housewives of Beverly Hills that couldn't drop the Sutton esophagus storyline. And I do not see any kind of comparison or reality for that being true. Anne-Marie was a completely, for me, different vibe. I've really enjoyed Katie this season so far, getting to know her family, 
you know, I thought it's been interesting. What I liked about the scene with Heather is that even when Heather's activated, Katie didn't really seem to be that pressed about it. It was like, okay, okay, well, just, you know, that's what I heard. You know, that's that's my friend. I, he's in charge of all the paparazzi. And I thought that was like, she didn't seem rattled at all, which I was like, wow, not rattled by Heather Dubrow. That's it's kind of cool. Um, so we'll see. But I just don't think we're in Anne Marie territory at all. And I also think there's a world in which that's what these shows are supposed to be about. Producers are like, OK, you heard this. Well, you should mention it. You got to mention it. So I believe I don't think it's a producer plant storyline, but I do think you're pushed into talking about this. You know, it gives her a little bit of a storyline and we'll see where it goes from here. But I just don't think it was that big of a deal. In fact, for me. The Anne Marie of this is Alexis Bellino, who will not stop talking about Johnny J, Johnny Bedore Jansen. We just call him John Bedore at this point. That to me is a storyline that feels like a uh, Sutton's esophagus. I don't need to know anything more. I'd rather hear more about paparazzi. The reintroduction of Victoria Gunvalson. Uh, the OG from the OC who immediately came on and in her first scene with Shannon talked about all of the pus that had not healed on her belly. And, uh, it, you know, her, her belly is just like a sponge of pus. And I was like, wow, that's super gross. And she also talked about escaping a hospital. And uh, yeah, that's wild. Very Vicky. And uh, yeah, so we have her back as kind of Shannon's ally, which Shannon definitely needs this season. And sometimes you're like, Vicky, maybe let's uh, let's. Let's get the stomach to heal. Let's get the pus less pussy. And then maybe, you know, maybe you're a stronger Victoria Gunvalson after everything's health wise going well. So we have her planning this show out with Shannon Bedore for the Dos Amigas because, you know, Tamara's gone. We had a scene from one of the earlier episodes where Tamara and Shannon confronted each other. And Shannon's like, when did I talk behind your? You said I'm a horrible friend. Oh, and you know, I was like, uh, yeah, check and check. I was like, yeah, you seem to be a horrible friend. Yeah, I mean, just ju judging by Shannon, that's how you're coming off, Tamara. You watch the same show that we do. Come on, even if you watched it and you were talking about it on a show, if it wasn't you, you would say the same thing. And it seems like it seems like you do. So they have this Tamara Shannon, you know, brutality happening, this fight, but you know. We also had the clip of Tamara going, having to do the show right after Shannon's DUI, trying to figure out what's going on in your life. Stop drinking. And then the other storyline we were dealing with this season is Gina. And I got to tell you, I am loving Gina this season. I, for some reason, everything's coming up Gina for me. I love her breaking into the real estate game. I'm Gina. I'm in real estate. And I got to protect my real estate image. I love it. And then, of course, this mystery with Travis and people have written me going, it's not a mystery, this, this and this. But to me, it's still a mystery because we haven't had a very clear cut conversation with details about Travis moving out. I mean, it really does feel like a soft launch of a breakup, even though they're still together. Right. At least that's how I feel. And Travis is so soft spoken. Anyways, we had the scene from last week where Gina is confiding in Heather about this. And Gina going, this is my decision about uh, about Travis moving out. And, you know, it's really tough. And then we also got the information that 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 Shannon got a letter from a lawyer representing John Bedore, John Jansen, and that she owes him seventy five thousand dollars for a facelift for a facelift. And we get more information about that on this app. We get way too much information. We actually get a receipt. And I don't mean a housewives receipt. I mean, an actual itemized receipt. And I just think, man, we've gone, we've gone, we've strayed so far from God's light on Real Housewives of Orange County, but fantastic flipping season so far. So we start the episode and there's like this really jaunty uh, uh, song playing in the background. It's like, I'm feeling good. I'm up so high in the sky. And we see like surfers surfing and we see like a dog running and everything seems really happy. And then we land on Heather Debro and Terry Debro. It's Valentine's Day and they're doing some sort of, I guess, breakfast where Heather just ordered all bacon and Terry's like, oh, just all bacon, crazy. And uh, I don't know which house they're in. I know they have like 30 of them and they I don't think they specified. So I'm not sure if it's like, you know, a Drake's place or if they're in the OC. But Heather is telling um, uh, Terry that uh, Gina and Jen are coming over for high tea, right? 
Which is great. I love a high tea m moment. And she confides in Terry. She goes, I got a little tipsy last night. And Terry's like, a little tipsy? You let me do butt stuff. <laughs> no, he didn't say that. But I, you know, we can imagine. We two and two together. And uh, Terry's like, you got altered. And Heather is, <laughs> you know, regaling uh, Terry with the story of the, the accusation about the paparazzi. And she's like, we were about to eat Terry. And then that Katie person, oh my God, Katie doesn't even go by Katie now. Heather has called her that Katie person. That Katie person, Janella, started accusing me, Terry, that I called the paparazzi. And she has proof. And Terry's like, ha, 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 ha. He's like, wait, wait, wait. So we're back to this we call the paparazzi nonsense. I like when paparazzi take pictures of me. And Heather's like, I know you do. He goes, I like it. That is Terry DeBro, king of honesty. Hell yeah, Terry. And it's like, I love when somebody just comes out and says it. Like, I was like, hell, yes, Terry, we know. And I love that you love it. I love that you like it. There's no shame in that. We, by the way, we know Terry likes to be on bots. Terry, Terry's been doing this since the swan. You know, the old Fox show, The Swan. Terry was like the plastic surgeon on The Swan. Terry's career is so, it's not just plastic surgery, it's television. He loves it. He loves being out there. And there's nothing wrong with that. And Heather likes it too. But I love that Terry said it. Anyways, Terry goes, if there's a number that Katie knows of to call to get paparazzi we will that will take pictures of me, I want this number. And Heather's like, oh, Terry, you're so funny. You are so, you are just, you are a hoot. Um, and uh, listen, I will say, uh, Terry, I think you have the number. I do. I don't think you maybe call it, but you guys all have the number. Come on. Let's start. Like, Terry, you guys are all smart as hell. You have all the numbers. But I like that Terry's like, yeah. Get, by the way, if Terry doesn't have the number, give him the number, you guys. Give him the number. Katie, give him the number of the King Paparazzi person you know. So we get out of that scene. We are now in Katie's house and Matt, her husband, uh, comes in and Katie is preparing a little charcuterie tray for her and Shannon Bedore. And these housewives, every like every time we see a charcuterie tray, an angel gets its wings. It's charcuterie tray and Orange County or any housewife shows go hand in hand. So Katie tells her husband that she got Shannon a Valentine's Day gift because it's Valentine's Day and she wants to show the people that she loves a happy Valentine's Day. And we see Shannon walking in and Shannon's like, hi, your house is so beautiful. I like when Shannon gets her like quiet, tiny voice. Your house is so beautiful. It kind of almost sounds like Whitney from Salt Lake. Your house is so beautiful. I'm on a healing journey. Um. And so it's like, you remember Shannon, Matt? Hi. And Shannon's like, ah, uh, hey, I ran my car into a house. Anyways, good to be here. Beautiful house. And Katie, you know, Katie, you know, gives flowers to Shannon. And, and Shannon's like, what? For me? Flowers? Are you kidding? Oh, this is crazy. And in a talking head, Shannon goes, I like Katie. Sometimes you meet people and you can just banter and kind of jab each other in a playful way. And we see a flashback of them like teasing each other at Katie's golf event. And I'm, I, I just want Shannon to have friends. So I love when somebody gets along with Shannon, right? Katie in a talking head goes, Katie in a talking head goes, I've heard that Shannon's a bit of a Debbie Downer, but she seems like an incredibly fun person. I actually really enjoy Shannon. Hell yeah, Katie. So they sit down and they do the housewives trope of what did you think of yesterday? So you, you have to talk. So, so it's always, you got to talk about the event leading up to the event. Then you got to do the event. And then you got to talk about the aftermath of the event. That's always, that's Housewives 101. So Katie's like, what did you think of the event? And Shannon goes, it was really nice to not have Alexis there. And Katie's like, you're dealing with enough. I just wanted you to be there and have a good time. And listen, I know you and Tamara still have a thing, but you guys were good yesterday. And Shannon goes, after what you and Heather went through, I didn't want to get in into that with her. But I definitely have to have a conversation with Tamara. I do. She's been talking behind my back to all of you guys. And we flash back to a scene from a previous, I don't know, previous episode. And Heather is telling Shannon and Gina, she's like, Tamara is not crazy about or comfortable with the fact that everyone just made up with you so fast, Shannon. Back in this scene, Shannon goes, you don't know what I'm going through, Tamara. You haven't checked in with me at all. You know, Katie's like, right on. 
And that is very true. Now we cut over to Tamrat and Tamra is running towards Emily on the beach. And she's like, happy Valentine's day. And it is Emily's 15 year anniversary with Shane Simpson. And remember that Emily did boudoir photography, which we went with Shannon to a couple episodes ago where Emily asked if her vagina looked fluffy. And I still don't know, is a fluffy, sorry, I know this is disgusting for me to talk about, but is a fluffy vagina, is that what we're going for? Or do we want not a fluffy vagina? I don't know. Is like, is, is fluffy vaginas like all the rage? Is it like a TikTok craze with the fluffy vagina or is a fluffy vagina bad? Yeah, I don't know. Like a fluffy vagina, it makes me think of like the Pillsbury Doughboy. You know what I'm saying? Anyways, we have more clips of Emily putting her fanny out in a, uh, you know, flashback to the boudoir photography. And Shane is getting one of these. He, he's getting one of these photos for the 15th anniversary, which I think is a great gift. It's, and she should also get him thirst busters. So remember Shane, like me, enjoys a nice thirst buster to carry around the house, you know, wherever he goes. I love that man. Anyways, Emily goes, I haven't even seen the photos. I don't even know which photo it's going to be. And Tamara's like, it's probably one with your ass in the air. I'm Tamara. I say provocative things. <laughs> it's probably one of your asshole. It's probably one of your starfish. Oh, I'm Tamara. Emily said, oh, yesterday I was actually pretty good at the golf event. I came in first. I won the glasses, which is great. She won, like, I think a nice pair of Gucci glasses. She's going to give them to Jen, though, she says. And Tamara goes, yeah, give them to Jen. She might need them. Because remember, they're all making fun of Jen because she's potentially poor. I mean, I, she, yeah, she, she owes a lot of money. So Tamara, of course, hops on that like, you know, a, a dog with a bone. And then Emily goes, yeah, she could wear them to Vegas when she travels to Vegas. And Tamara's like, she was just in Vegas. And Emily goes, I know. That's why I just said that. And we flash back to Ryan, not me, Ryan, Ryan. And Jen at the Sphere in Vegas. And we talked about that last episode where Jen was like, I'm worried about going to Vegas because I think the ladies are going to be, why are you going to Vegas if you have no money? And I think this is like a non-starter. It's a non-issue because it's like Ryan's paying with his illegal money. Like, I don't think that Jen's out there spending her own money. I think Ryan's spending his money on Jen. So for me, it was a non-issue. I mean, the bigger issue for me is that these guys enjoy Malibu and Cokes. Like to me, that's the bigger red flag than going to Vegas. I mean, that's the drink Malibu and Coke. That's a, that's a college drink. Anyways, Tamara says, I'm pretty sure Ryan paid for it. She can't just sit at home and look at her empty bank account. So Tamara being supportive, but also throwing her under the bus. Amazing. Emily says, I have a hard time with women who want other people to pay their way and they don't want to put the work in themselves. And Tamara in the talking head says, me and Emily, we're a little scrappy. We can take care of ourselves. Jen is not that personality. And it's frustrating to see because she's going through all this shit, but it's kind of like Shannon. It's self-induced. Okay. Okay. I do agree with Tamara that I think her and Emily are self-starters. I think Tamara will always, I mean, she's scrappy. She's always going to be involved in a bunch of different businesses. I think Tamara's very successful that way. I think Emily has her hands in a lot of things. I mean, but it takes all kinds of people. We're not all the same. We're not all made up the same. And the fact that these women or any of us in our forties or fifties, or, you know, like don't understand that about the way the world works is that just because you're a self-starter and that you don't self-induce pain on yourself doesn't mean that others don't do that. Like God, you should think the lucky stars that you won the lottery and you're the type of person that isn't the type of person that you're slagging off every episode, but you have to leave room in your heart that not everybody is like you. Anyways, Tamara's like, oh, did you hear anything about yesterday about Shannon? And Emily's like, you know, and, and uh, Tamara goes, Shannon was hiding behind a pole at one point. And we see a photo of Shannon behind a pole at one point. I don't know if she was hiding. It makes her kind of look like she was hiding. And Tamara goes, I have no idea. And we made some small talk, me, me, and, me and Shannon. Tamara goes, are you proud of me? And Emily's like, I'm very proud of you. And I'm like, don't be that proud. And Tamara's like, what the hell's going on? And what is this Katie girl do doing about Heather? What all these things? What is Tamara? What is Katie doing? Tamara, this is the two face talking out of both sides of your ass that I'm talking about. You know exactly what Katie's doing. She's doing the thing that you all encouraged her to do when you went on your like coyote ugly night where you danced on the bar. Like, you know, exactly you 
had you had a girl boner when she revealed that information about Heather Dubrow. You love it. You know, this is how the show works. You all jumped on it. You all encouraged it. And also Tamara's the one that threw Katie under the bus with this information. I mean, it's so diabolical and weird and like not any sort of uh, camaraderie or female friendship at all. So the fact that then this is the beauty of Tamara. She can come into a new scene and go, what was Katie doing? What was all that about? Well, I gotta know. Maybe she was reacting to the the way you threw her under the bus as she had to talk to Heather. Like, what do you mean? What is she doing? That's the one thing you should know, Tamara. Emily goes, all I'm saying is all along, if you're going to bring this up, if Katie's going to bring this up and you're going to go after Heather Devro, you better have your ducks in a row. You better have your T's crossed, your eyes dotted, because she will tear you apart. Once again, the fear that these ladies think they have about Heather Debro blows me away because Heather is a lot of things, but I just don't think of her as scary. I mean, I don't know, but they're all like, they all think it's like Slender Man or something. It's like Freddy Krueger, like Heather DeBros haunting the, 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 all the people on Coda de Casa in their dreams. Like, I'm like, what do you all have all your ducks, have your, have your T's crossed? Like, it's not Harvey Weinstein. My God, it's Heather DeBro. Heather, I mean, she's like putting leeches on her body and doing like new diet techniques with Terry. Like, what are you talking? I just don't understand. I know I'm like amped up today, but my God. Anyways, we cut back to that scene with Heather and Terry. And Heather's like, what I didn't like was that that girl, Katie, told all the girls, she told all the girls, Terry, that this paparazzi stuff. But why did Gina allow that to happen? Why did Gina allow that to happen? And Terry's just poking at his food going, my God, I've got to fix I got to fix a wrecked botched boob job later. I'm too, I'm not, I can't do this. Like Terry must be like at certain points during a season of filming, he's got to be like, there's got to be better ways to make money. It's got to be better ways. Like, my God, like, can, can I retire all right? Like, this is, why do I have to keep hearing about this shit? Anyways, somebody knocks at the door and I was like, BRB, BRB, Terry. He's like, uh, so it's going to be Gina or Jen coming. But the, 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 why did Gina allow this to happen? This is another thing that it's like, I get, it, it's like, God, is the storylines this thin that it's like, we already saw a scene with Gina and Katie where Gina was like, yo, if you don't tell Heather this, I'm going to have to tell Heather this as a friend because Gina is worried about her friendship with Heather and does consider Heather a friend. But I'm like, how did you allow this to happen? What did Gina, I just don't understand how that would be Gina's responsibility at all. Anyways, it's Gina. She comes, he's like, what's going on? I'm in real estate. I'm Gina. And Gina's like, hi, Terry. I haven't seen you in so long. Bring it in for a hug. And he's like, you know, and he's like, you look fit. You, you look fit. I wonder when Terry sees any of these people, he's just like going over what he could do to them plastic surgery wise. And now that I'm thinking about it, why didn't, why didn't Shannon go to Terry to bro for a facelift? I feel like we could have gotten a discount that could have meant more money in John Jansen's pocket. Did we ever consider Terry to bro for the facelift? And why wasn't that a storyline? Can you imagine Shannon Bedore on an episode of Botched? Oh my goodness. By the way, that facelift, amazing money spent. She looks amazing. Anyways, Terry has all his vitamins on the table. And Gina's like, how has it been with all the heart stuff? And Terry's like, well, the heart thing, I was on blood thinners for six months. Last week, my last dose. She's like, but now you're in the clear. And he's like, yep, now I'm good. So Terry has a clean bill of health. Hell yeah. Many more paparazzi photos will be taken uh, of Terry in the future. And I love that. Okay. So now Jen Pedranti comes in and every, you know, it's the, you look pretty, all of this stuff. Hi, hello, Terry. How are you? The whole thing. So Terry immediately like, how's Ryan? How's, how's, how's your, how's your guy, Ryan? He's like, oh, he's good. He's good. By the way, how's Travis, Gina? And Gina quietly goes, Tra Travis is good. And she's like, yeah, we, we're going through. Going through a little thing, but we're all right. Yeah. And Terry's like, he's like, good. Okay. Okay. And then just awkward silence. And then Terry's, uh, then Heather's like, we are having Galentine's Day today, Terry. Terry's like, well, I got to go. Good to see you guys. So Heather has this whole room set up with like little, like tea, little crumpets. They have face masks that they're going to do. And by the way, a Heather DeBro face mask, that's got to be like the best. Like these got to be made out of fucking 24 karat gold. So they're going to do face masks, talk some shop. And Gina goes, I'm sorry about the Katie stuff. I knew you were upset, Heather. So I'm sorry about that. And Heather goes, now I'm just confused and irritated. I am. 
And Gina's like, the weird thing is, I really like Katie, and I thought you guys were going to be good friends. I'm still getting to know her, too. And at this point, they're starting to put on the gel masks. And that's just, that's like a, a nice touch. You know, it kind of looks like eyes wide shut. It looks like they're in masks, all made of gold. Little Phantom of the Opera. Masquerade! Da, 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 da. So they're talking very seriously with these ridiculous gold masks on their face. And I'm here for it. And uh, Gina continues, you know, like, I'm, I'm sorry, you know. And Heather's like, you're my friend. I am your friend. And I have been your friend. And Heather goes, I would expect you to tell her it's not okay. Now we go back, we cut over back to Shannon and Katie and Shannon is still talking to Katie and going, well, I think she's probably the most sensitive person in the group, uh, Gina. Uh, no, sorry, talking about Heather. She said, I think Heather is the most sensitive person in the group, telling this to Katie. And Shannon goes, I was admiring you holding your ground with Heather. I really was. And Katie goes, I never meant to push her buttons. And Shannon's like, well, I mean, if it's true, why is she denying it? And Katie goes, I have proof. I want to show you this text. Can I show it to you? And Shannon's like, well, yeah, I just got to get my readers. Got to get my readers. And she shows, this is the person I got the information for. And Shannon reads the text. And the text from Katie is, settle this for me. Did Heather DeBrow call Paps to come take pics of her and her husband in public? And the guy just wrote back, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry. I mean, like, listen, I like Katie a lot, but that is very thin proof. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And then there's no further conversation. From the, like, can we ask a follow-up? Can we get a little more specific? Because, listen, I could write yes. Like, yes. And Katie's like, do you think I made that up? She's like, no, no. Katie in the talking head goes, she hung me out to dry. And we flash back to that scene with Gina where Gina goes, oh, I want you to have that opportunity to talk to Heather. But if you don't do that, I'm going to tell Heather. And then we flash back to the golf event where Gina is telling Katie, I adore you. I wanted you to be friends. I told you not to bring this up. And this is what happens. I told you not to bring this up. We just had a scene where you did tell her to bring this up. And Katie in the talking head goes, I think when it comes down to it, Gina regrets telling me to say it. She's terrified of disappointing Heather. Once again, we're in this narrative of Heather is the scariest person that has ever been born. The scariest person. And maybe with one of those face masks on, she is. I don't know. So Emily and Tamara, we're back to that scene. And Emily's like, I think the friendship with Heather and Gina, and Gina always stands by Heather, no matter what. When it comes to me, she will call me out because she and I have a real friendship. And Tamara goes, that's what you want in a friend. It sure is, Tamara. It is what you want in a friend. Huh. Who else could we actually use that in an example with of somebody not being a friend? Oh, that's right. You with Shannon. So Emily goes, but when it comes to Heather, Gina, it's not the same. And Tamara's like, she's afraid of her. Yeah. She walks on eggshells. Don't want to upset her. And Tamara goes, now it's going to be very interesting with Katie. And Emily's like, probably. And Tamara's like, she's going to be completely done with her. I don't know. I think we're going to be going to Katie's funeral pretty soon. And Emma's like, Emma's like, we should all wear black. You guys all, you, you're all, you keep saying you're going to go to Katie's funeral. You literally hung her out to die dry. She, I mean, like, <laughs> like you all encouraged her to do it. You should have been like, but I want you to know, we all want you to do it because we love storylines, but you're going to die. You will be assassinated on this show. Like, I mean, if anybody liked Katie even a little bit, they would be like, just know it's not going to go well for you. You're really going into a very dark, dark place. You're going to Elm Street. So it's so funny in the aftermath of like, oh, we're going to go to her funeral. Like, maybe you should have warned her when you were like encouraging her. I get so confused. Now, back to Gina. Gina's like, oh, I, I know Katie enough to know that this isn't indicative of really who she is. And Heather's like, when did you meet her? A couple of months ago through Sutton. Well, I say, I say, don't bring my, don't bring my name up, Sutton Strack. I'm scared of Heather DeBro as well. I would never cross Heather DeBro. Oh, my God. The, the stories of Heather DeBro's legend has come all the way down to Beverly Hills, I say, I say. And I don't need that kind of heat on me. Oh, no, no, no. Miss Sutton Strack cannot take a confrontation with Miss Heather DeBro. So Heather in the scene is like, when did she tell you all this? And Gina's like, well, a couple months ago. And 
Heather's like, before Sutton's Christmas party? And Gene's like, yeah, before Sutton, yeah. In a talking head, Jenna goes, I do think Gina is to blame for this going as far as it did. Gina claims to know Heather very, very well. So I don't know where Gina ever thought this would be funny for Heather. Heather goes, what's upsetting to me, Gina? Why didn't you tell me in December? And Gina just leans back with her eye patches on. I thought it was in the best interest of everybody to let that go and to never bring that up. And that was the decision that I made. And Heather goes, I wish you had said something. I know, I fucked up. I fucked up, Heather. I'm sorry. She goes, thank you. Thank you. And Jen's like, everybody fucks up. I owe a lot of money right now. Um, where do we go from here? And Heather goes, I want her to just keep her distance. And Jen goes, I liked her. I am not telling you, Jen Pedronti, to be not be friends with this girl. I mean, I will say she's showing her character. So you should make your decision on your friendship with her for yourself. But that is something to know. Uh-oh. So Heather's doing that thing of like, you can make your own decision, but at the end of the day, you know, her character's not that great. So that'll say a lot about you. You know, it's that classic thing we see, but it's just a very confusing storyline in some ways because I just don't, at the end of the day, who cares? I don't care if Heather called the paparazzi. I don't care if she didn't. It's not that big of a deal. Like, I feel like also this is something Heather can just brush off like dirt on her shoulder. Who cares? If Heather didn't do it, who cares? Like, you know, it, it's not like assaulting somebody. Like, oh no, the rumors are out there that I called the paparazzi. Who cares? At the end of the day, you live next to Drake. You're fine. Who cares? And that's like the big thing. Like, it's funny to watch because they're taking it so seriously. So there's dark comedy in that. But I just can't bring myself to fully hop on board the storyline. Am I alone in this? Okay, so now we're at a scene for the 15th anniversary of Shane and Emily Simpson, right? So they sit down. I I, gotta, I like this Shane Simpson. I like him a lot. And uh, this is where we're going to get the sexy reveal of the sexy boudoir photography. And, you know, Shane saying, oh, I, you know, I, I took care of the kids today. And Emily's like, I went to the gym. I didn't see you there. And Shane's like, oh, all of a sudden you're high and mighty because now you go to the gym. And Emily's like, I will bench press you, fool. How much can you bench, bitch? No, she's like, no, I'm just saying, you know, uh, <laughs> talking head, Emily really throws Shane under the bus because Shane has made zero effort to be any healthier and to do anything about his health at all. I love that this Shane is a man after my own heart. I love to do nothing about my health. It's really hard. <laughs> I, like, I love it, man. Emily goes, I swear, just like a week ago, he almost died of a heart attack. And I'm sure he'll get like a meat lover's pizza tonight. And then we have Shane order the Supreme pizza, which is like the meat lover's pizza. Emily gets a healthy chopped salad. And then uh, Shane also gets fries. He's like, I'd like fries as an entree. Emily goes, I actually did research for tonight. I Googled 15 years of marriage. Interesting questions for your spouse. And Shane's like, okay. And Emily's like, if you could go back 15 years, would you still marry me? And he goes, oh, um, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. And Emily goes, really? Like, why is that surprising? And Shane goes, if you could go back 15 years, who would you marry? And Emily goes, is Charlie Hunnam single? Charlie Hunnam's the guy for like Sons of Anarchy and stuff like that. And then they put up a photo of Charlie and Shane. And I got to tell you, in my personal, I don't have great eyesight. I think Shane wins this hands down. This man, he is a sex god, Shane Simpson. Anyway, Shane goes, I don't find that funny. Go ahead. Next question. Do I have any silly or odd quirks, Shane? And he goes, yeah, you, you leave your eyelashes everywhere throughout the house. I, you know, I, I've seen them on your like back or as you roll over the bed, they're on the floor. Dude, I need, I need some Emily Simpson eyelashes for my reality show museum. And he's like, it looks like we have a bunch of caterpillars in the house. Then Emily goes, do you say nice things about me when I'm not around? And Shane goes, absolutely. And then she goes, okay, give me the last example. He goes, I tell the kids all the time, nice things. What do you tell the kids, Shane? Well, I always tell them that you're like the best mom. Mom loves you. I say it all the time. And Emily's like, that's very sweet. And she's like, thank you. And she says, that means a lot to me because I feel like I broke the cycle. I came from divorced parents who could not co-parent, who would not speak to each other. And uh, I, I I, like that. I like these guys. Anyways, she's into talking about, she's like, here I am 15 years into a marriage and we're raising children together. And I think we're pretty good at it. Shane goes, I have something for you. And she's like, like a gift? And he goes, yeah, I have a gift. He goes, well, yeah, sometimes when you say that, you mean your penis. That's right, dude. 
I would, God, I would have given every anything if this went into like a dick in a box song where Shane was like, I got you a dick in a box, a dick in a box. Yay, yay. A Shane Simpson dick in a box. A Shane Simpson. Uh -huh. uh -huh. I love that Shane is like, it's like typical dad penis jokes. Love it. Anyways, Shane picks up the gift and he goes, I upgraded your engagement ring. And uh, she's like, wow, that looks really big. Like Shane's penis, you know what I'm saying? Up top. Anyways, he puts the ring on her and he goes, do you like it? And she's like, yeah, it looks nice. And he goes, yeah, take care of it. Don't go to the gym with it. And Emily goes, I have a gift for you too, but I have to have it brought out. 15 years is such a huge milestone. Shane and I are at this point where, I don't know, I feel like we really understand each other. And I mean, at the end of the day, Shane is the only person that I want to spend the rest of my life with. <laughs> oh, I... Listen, it was revealed earlier, lately, uh, last week that I have low testosterone. And so I got to tell you, I, I'm tearing up even just talking about this. I, I the, the estrogen is flowing through my body and my low testosterone. I just think it's beautiful. I love when somebody says, I can't see myself with any other person. Anyways, this gift is brought out. It's wrapped up. We know it's the sexy Emily photo. And Shane goes, I don't think this is mine because it's addressed to the luckiest man in the world. Hey, oh, dad joke. So Emily goes, you are the luckiest person because you have me. And she goes, I hope Shane and I are together for another 15. And I hope that the next 15 is a little bit healthier. Maybe I can get Shane on the train on the treadmill. Maybe we can lift some weight. And I made sure that he has a life insurance policy and has me as the beneficiary. <laughs> oh, so he opens it and it's like a sexy shot. And like, we have like reaction shots of everybody as the gift is being unopened. And he's like, it's not, she's like, it's not that inappropriate. I will say it's full nude. They have to like, it's full nude. we got the bush nipples ever. Like you see your butthole all of, no, it's not. It's like a very tasteful erotic photo photo. And he goes, pretty hot, pretty hot. And he goes, he goes, wait, do you have those clothes? And Emily goes, I'll wear it later. And winks at Shane and Shane winks back. I got to tell you, if Shane doesn't want this, this is another thing. The eyelashes and this photo would be great for the reality show music. What if you people came in and I'd be like, oh, I see you're looking at my Emily Simpson boudoir photo photo. Oh, it's a funny story of how I picked that up. I offered Shane Simpson a thousand dollars and uh, a lifetime supply of thirst busters from 7-Eleven and uh, of big gulps. Yeah, I, I, I would love an Emily Simpson boudoir photo. I want to see the rest of that photo shoot, by the way. So I love that. That seemed to go well. I think this couple, they're great. And by, by the way, everybody is always like, oh, I was so shocked about Mauricio and Kyle splitting up. I would be shocked if Shane and Emily Simpson split up. And I think I, like, I wasn't sad about Mauricio and Kyle. It kind of like shocked me, but not, I don't know, you know, like they have very busy, different lives now. But Shane and Emily, I think they should be together for the rest of their lives. I, I want that. Anyways, we cut to the next scene and Katie is meeting Gina the real estate queen at this like coffee shop. So they hug. Hello. And I'm like, uh Oh, what's going to happen here? Well, what, what, sparks going to fly because Gina threw Katie under the bus. Gina's like in between Heather. Anyways, they sit down and it's like, you know, basic small talk. And like, you know, Katie's like, what have you been up to? And she's like, well, I had a small Valentine's with Travis, you know, we're trying to figure out the new normal. It's confusing, but I think the takeaway from all of it is that we really love each other. Like we want to be together, even though I made him move out down the road. In a talking head, Gina's like, I see that there is a hope and a chance that, look, we're an unconventional family and we can redefine our family any way we like. <laughs> we can redefine, you know, it can mean I live here and he lives 800 miles away. We can redefine the relationship. Anyway, she tells uh, Katie, we to trying to make it work and figure it out. And I have to believe that that's what's going to happen, right? So and Katie's like, well, it's cliche, but if it's meant to be, it's meant to be kind of a thing. And, uh, and then Gina goes, why do you seem tired today, Katie? Which is kind of a brutal thing to say to somebody. And Katie's like, well, I mean, because of the golf event. And Gina's like, yeah, okay. Katie's like, I feel like I'm in a weird spot, Gina, right now, because I felt kind of abandoned by you a little bit uh-oh intense music starts playing dramatic music you totally took heather's side you know where i felt like there was a way you could have stayed a little bit neutral yeah but i'll be honest i'm not going to stay neutral i'm in real estate now 
you can't stay neutral in real estate. Well, I did have you back, Katie. I did. Like I told you not to bring it up. Yeah. When we first talked about it, Katie said, and then you did, it was too far gone. And Gina goes, yeah, because of your own doing. Gina is really like Gina used to back down all the time. Gina's like, boom. Like I like Katie and I really like Gina this season. So there's like an awkward pause in a talking head, which by the way, like I, I, I'm complimenting Gina so much, but I do have to say sometimes there's old flourishes of the old Gina. And I will say her talking head look, her ensemble, um, it, it was not my favorite. Um, it is weird. It's like a shiny dress that looks like it potentially could be made of denim. The hair, it looks like there's all these ruffles in the, the I, guys, I don't, I'm not good with fashion. I shop at Old Navy still mainly. So I really don't know. I just know I don't think it worked. Like she's had better talking head looks. And so I was, you know, it's one of those things when you're watching a show and then you're like, oh, you know, like they go to the talking head. You're like, oh, uh oh, new outfit. And then it just, it didn't add up. Anyways, in the talking head, she's like, I did want Katie to communicate the things that she's been communicating to everybody else to Heather. So maybe that's the one area that I could see. Katie feels that I wasn't supporting her, but I'm not going to support you through your bullshit. I'm Gina. I'm not. Anyway, she tells Katie, I'm caught between a rock and a hard place because if I would have come to your aid, then Heather would have just got pissed at me. And now she's mad at both of us. And I can't even help repair this. And honestly, I feel like in all of this, I probably should have had Heather's back more. Oh, you see, this is, this is getting the other side of like the, the stick, you know, Katie's like, oh shit. Okay. Oh, everybody's abandoning me now. Everybody's super excited about the information. I reveal it. And now everybody's distancing themselves. And Gina continues. I'm very close with Heather. I'm not going to jeopardize my own friendships. She took me on a private airplane one time. I'm not jeopardizing that. Are you crazy? I'm not going to do that because of the choices that you made, Katie. And then they just kind of like stare at each other. And Katie's like, listen, I, le I left being yelled at by Heather DeBro. And I wasn't even upset about that. But with you, I value you so much that I did feel kind of alone. I don't want you to feel that way. No, I'm really, you're really upset about this. I did not mean, and Katie's starting to tear up. And, and, and Gina's like, oh my God, Katie, you're tearing up. I did not, I'm so sorry. Katie in a talking head goes, I really love Gina. But now it all makes me think back on every situation where we talked. Everything I said was maybe going to be used against me when I didn't feel that was our relationship. Like, am I a fucking idiot? Katie says, Katie, uh, this is a very special time in any housewife's life. When I can say, Katie, welcome to the real housewives. You're here, baby. It is like everything will and can be used against you. Everything. Anyways, Katie's like, ah, it sucks. And Gina's like, well, listen, Katie, I apologize. I don't want you to think that's a standard or something in the future. I think this particular situation is just really tricky for me. And if you know you felt that way, I feel really bad. I really want this to get better. And Katie's like, well, maybe it just won't for a little while. Katie knows. It's not. I mean, listen, Tamara just said that uh, Heather's going to kill her. Heather's going to uh, literally slaughter poor Katie Janela. So now we're in a scene with Shannon and her dad, Gene the Machine. And Gene is already there. He's ordered a glass of wine. She's like, oh, you've gotten a glass of wine. That is quite a pour, dad. Quite a pour. He's like, right, right. I like Shannon's at right. Yep. And uh, the waiter comes up. How are you doing? Would you like anything to drink? And she's like, well, water, sparkling water with no ice. And then like, yeah, I feel like she should wink at the camera. See, I'm not drinking alcohol. Take that camera. Anyway, Shannon's like, there's a park that's a block from my house, dad. And there was a couple there with their dog. And they said, we met Gene the Machine. And Gene's like, oh, really? And she's like, dad, do you still introduce yourself as Gene the Machine? And he goes, yes, yes, I do. Yes. And Shannon's like, oh, that's delightful. He goes, it just sounds good. It sounds good. Shannon goes, I do think I have some similarities to my father, but I don't go to the lengths that he does. And we have, you know, flashbacks of uh, Shannon actually being insane and wild. So she is like, she does go through the link uh, to the lengths of Gene, the machine. Um, and then Shannon's like, yeah, we both like to have fun. I will say, I love Shannon's talking head outfit. She's like in this red, like literally a crochet top with like a black bow or hair's all done up. The one thing is though, there's a missing tooth that Shannon has. It looks like on her bottom half of her teeth. That's the only thing where I was like, what's the story there? Did, did she, did John Jansen not pay for that? The missing tooth? Like what, what's going on with the missing tooth? So 
in the scene, she's like, uh, Dad, they have sea bass here. I like tacos. You do, Dad? Yeah, I do like tacos. I do. So they order. And we get down to business. She goes, oh, Dad, I need to get a car and get like a breathalyzer put in it for part of my punishment, you know, for my DUI. It's going to be a reminder every day of my stupid decision. Well, are you cutting down somewhat on your drinking? Dad, I barely drink. Oh, that's good. I limit myself to two, and sometimes I don't order drinks when I go out, so I'm okay. She says, in a talking about growing up, did we have the big bottle of Alameden Chablis in the refrigerator? You're damn right we did. She's like, I think everyone did in the 70s and 80s. It was a different time, folks. I just come from a fun family. Like, we had fun. We, we whooped it up. But I didn't see alcohol being used as a coping mechanism when I was a child. It was just something that I realized helped me forget the certain things. But then in the end, you're really depressed. Like she says, I, I, I didn't think of it as a coping mechanism, but then she used it as a coping me me mechanism. But I love that she adds in this, but then you're really sad and depressed, right? And then, so Gene, the machine's like, you, you hit rock bottom. And so now you're going out. Like, yeah, yeah. When I was with John, we were drinking all the time, she says in the talking head. And I was miserable. I was. By the way, we saw that on the show. Remember, I always said they were, it was like they were professional drinkers. They were that couple that like, oh, let's start drinking around 3 p.m. It just, you got that feeling from them. They were toxic for each other. It's great that she is away from him. Anyway, she's like, dad, I've got some not so great news. And Gene's trying to enjoy a taco right now. John Jansen, dad, is saying that I owe him $75,000. And if I don't pay him, he's going to sue me. There's a pause. He says that he loaned me money, dad. Did he? No, as far as I was concerned, Dad, he was giving me the money. I never signed anything. Why would he want to sue you, Shannon, when you paid for everything before? Well, it said in the letter, Dad, I have until Tuesday to come up with a repayment plan. You have to fight it. I don't care what it costs, Shannon. You have to fight it. I'm trying to enjoy tacos. You go, and then he goes, you go for the, ju you go for the juggler. <laughs> He's trying to say juggler. You go for the juggler. You've got to go. Yeah, I say go for the juggler, John Jansen's John Jansen's juggler. You gotta go for the juggler. I'm with I'm with Gene the Machine. You gotta go, you gotta make this man pay. You've got to take him out of the juggler. You gotta, Shannon. We raised you bet. I'm enjoying tacos and a glass of wine. So we get out of that scene, even though I love I want more Gene the Machine. I, I, I love that dude. Okay, so we it's night has fallen in Orange County, and Tamara is going to uh, Alexis Bellino's house and we see Alexis feeding treats to her dogs. She's like, here's your treats, dogs. Have I told you about John Jansen today? He's just, yeah, it's so... Uh... Which, by the way, it's just amazing that Alexis can actually do a scene with Tamara, be, you know, taken away from her busy schedule of porking John Bedore, Jansen, Johnny J. Okay, so Tamara comes in and I'm already, I, like, already going into the scene, I was like, I'm going to hate this. I'm going eat this so they do the hugs and uh she brought cookies for the kids Tamara bought brought Tamara's great uh alexis says this is my second time living here and Tamara's like that's right you used to live in the same neighborhood with your ex jimbolino i was driving to your house right now and i go what in the fucking world am i driving to alexis bolito's house to sit in her living room and eat peas and drink diet coke and Alexa's like, you would have never been invited before. And they're just both laughing. And it's just great when when mutual hatred of another cast member can bring two ladies that hated each other together. I mean, that just, it's beautiful. It's God's plan, right? Um, but I love that they're giggling about this. Remember, goes, times have changed. I feel like the Alexis I knew, you know, 10 years ago is not the Alexis I know today. <laughs> how, how convenient. Isn't it convenient? We flash back to an earlier season with Alexis and Alexis and Tamara are fighting and Tamara's like, you get the fuck out. You get the fuck out, Alexis. Tamara and her talking head goes, now she's fun and she's sweet. And, and I enjoy being around her. She's kind and she hates Shannon Bedore like I do. Tamara in the scene goes, you saw the group text, text message about going to dinner, right? Gina invited everybody to dinner on Thursday. And Alexis is like, why would Gina invite me? Katie wouldn't. And I live on a golf course. I didn't get invited. Why wasn't I invited? And I was like, because you're a friend of Alexis. <laughs> and Tamara goes, well, I asked and she has become friendly with Shannon. Katie has, and she felt it would be disrespectful to Shannon if you were there. Huh? 
Wow. What's that remind me of? Oh, that's right. A friend. Tamara, I know that's probably, you know, surprising to you because you don't exhibit those same characteristics. It must have taken you aback. Anyways, Alexis hears this and goes, okay. Tamara goes, I guess she kind of picked a side. And then in the talking head, Alexis goes, you invited De Debbie Downer over Lexi? I mean, if you're going to have a party, who's going to be more fun, huh? And then she does this weird shaking her boobs motion. And she goes, this one, this one's more fun. Lexi, happy go lucky Lexi. Happy go Lexi. It almost looks like happy go lucky, lucky Lexapro. Like, I mean, there's something happening here. Like calm. I know you are high on the love of Johnny J, but my God, who's going to be more fun? Who's going to be? And when did she start calling herself Lexi? We're not rebranding, babe. You're Alexis. We're not doing, no, you are not Lexi. You are Alexis, even though I will now call you Lexi. But like, come on, you're rebranding yourself? And then anyway, she goes, okay, I'll be at the next one. <laughs> Shaking my Jesus jugs. It's Lexi. Coming up to the stage now is Lexi. Give it up for Lexi. It's dollar shots for the ladies. Uh, here she is, Lexi Bellino. Anyways. Alexis goes, oh, Tamara, what happened with you and Shannon at that party? Because I know, and Tamara's like, nothing. I'll be cordial to Shannon. I don't agree with a lot of things that went down between us. And Alexis goes, for you, I feel like kind of as your friend. I like now, and kind of as your friend, like, you know, because we are friends, we are going to keep labeling ourselves friends. I feel like I know she's really done a lot of shit on you and done a lot. And then Tamara, of course, eats that up. Yeah, alcoholics abuse the people that are closest to them. Her life has been upside down for 10 years since I've known her. Like everything was a disaster. And we flash back to one of the earlier seasons where Shannon was like, you will all see the truth. You will all see the fucking truth. And, you know, Tamara's like, Shannon, stop it. Stop it. I mean, Shannon has been in crisis so many seasons. I mean, she's really put it all out there. And Tamara goes, everything was emotional, Lexi. Everything was emotional. We flash back to another scene with Shannon where Shannon's flipping out. It irritates me that we talked about it the other night. Tamara goes, you don't need to get riled up about this, Shannon. And Shannon goes, it's just my nature. It's just who I am. I'm emotional. You are. You're a, I love you. You're emotional. You admit it. Yes. Anyway, she's like, everything was a wreck. And then another scene, a flashback where Tamara's like, I'm trying to help you, Shannon. And Shannon's like, you didn't say I needed to be on goddamn medication. How dare you? Tamara says to Lexi, it is traumatizing. She would call me crying almost every single day. It's hard to be around somebody like that a lot. Even my children would say, mom, please don't pick up the phone. Eddie would say, I don't know why. I don't know why you feel they need the need to try to fix her. By the way, I mean, that's an interesting point she brings up is that if Tamara was looking at fixing, maybe Shannon didn't need fixed. Maybe she just needed a friend. And you were looking at trying to fix her and maybe she just needed a friend. Now, I think the reality is more akin to, yeah, she just was annoyed with Shannon. She didn't want to deal with it. Shannon was probably a lot to deal with, but don't like, uh, like some moral high horse about her drinking too much and blah, blah, blah. It just seems like you couldn't be a friend to Shannon. You weren't interested in it. You got back on the show. You begged her to be your friend last season. It happened. And then you got tired of being her friend. You used her for last season. You got where you needed to be. And now it's sayonara, sweetheart. I mean, but I'm sorry. When somebody is in crisis, you know, you choose to be friends with these people. You also have to choose to be their friend then to actually exhibit friend qualities. Now, Alexis is really just like living in Tamara's asshole at this point and going, Tamara, you've got a good heart. And Tamara's like, I know it just puts so much stress on me. I've always felt really sorry for Shannon back from the days of David I was always there for her. I was always listening to her problems. I was always trying to help her out. But if I needed something, which was rare, she was never there. She was never there for me. Can we get an example, Tammy? Can we get an example of when she was never there for you? Anyways, she tells Lexi, somebody in that level needs rehab. And Alexis is like, I thought she did. No, no, she went to therapy. And Alexis just shakes her head for her to learn how to not date the wrong guys. She's blaming him for her drinking. And I was like, okay, first off, good. Go to therapy to learn how to not date the wrong guys. That's part of it. It's all tied up into one thing. First off, good. If you're going to therapy, that's good. Go to therapy. 
Other things are going to come up like the drinking, which is an aspect of their past relationship. Anyways, Lex is like, can I tell you something? John or Johnny, as I call him, has barely drank anything since I've been with him the entire time. It's hard to drink something when you're constantly having sex. It's hard to put a glass up to your mouth when you are boinking this much. Tamara goes, you know, it's so weird to hear you talk about Johnny J. Jansen because it's a totally different scenario than what Shannon would tell us. John pays for nothing. I have to pay for everything. And she was always telling us that. But then she told me, she's like, I borrowed 60,000 from John. And Alexis goes 75,000. I do want to point out also Alexis has a cross on her neck, a cross necklace. Anyways, and they're talking to Shannon goes, last year she told me that he paid for her facelift. Normally when you break up, you have to give like a ring back or something. How the fuck is she going to give her face back? Listen, I don't know how that technology works. We, we should get Terry to bro with. I don't know how you give a facelift back. I, I, I don't think you can. But I also, when you think about that, I get scared sometimes with the Britney and Jax thing. Do you think Jax is going to try to take back those boobs he bought for Britney? Like when he put those Ds on it? Like, do you think he's going to try to get that back? I think Jax will, especially after this cameo debacle. Anyways, Lexi, Alexa says, you know how we always said, bring the receipts? I'll bring the receipts. I don't want to go to battle, but if you're going to lie about the man I'm going to marry and ruin our reputation together, she's going to need another facelift to pick her jaw off the floor when I provide the proof. Girl, st just stop. Stop. And this, I will say, the producers have really left Alexis to like hang herself, like hung her out to dry in a sense, because Alexis has so much more to her story. And I know she's just a friend of, but she has children. She has a like, really interesting story there. She's, you know, uh, divorced. She uh, broke off an engagement. Uh, her mom passed away. There is so much more to Alexis than John Jansen and Shannon Bedore, yet she is only used as a chess piece in a battle against Shannon Bedore. And you, you know, listen, I understand love has literally made her high. She just seems high on love. And I get that. We've all been there, right? But girl, take it down about eight notches. It's just, it, it really, you're not doing yourself any favors because at the end of the day, the season is going to be over. And if you literally, your whole thing is Johnny J and Shannon B, we don't know you. We don't know the new Alexis. Cause I'm certainly not seeing the new Alexis. Now it seems a lot like, it seems like the relationship with John is very much how that relationship with Jim Bellino was where it was like, hug, you know, in Christ, you, we are part of like, I, I own your body through Christ. Like it seems very, and it seems like Alexis really likes that type of relationship that is all consuming and all demanding. And she really will go to war for this person who she thinks is the love of her life. And maybe it is, but I don't care. I'm not here to see the Johnny J Alexis show. You know, anyway, she says, Shannon is poking a bear, a sexy religious bear. So yeah. Woo, tough stuff. Okay, so we do that round robin thing where we get a, like a little glimpse at like Gina telling her son that he's going to stay over at Travis's place. And does he have a toothbrush there? Because she has a dinner tonight with friends. Then we go over to Emily's place, who's picking out some shoes with her daughter. Her daughter says everything's tacky. Then we go over to Katie's place and her and her daughter are picking out an outfit like the Balmain. And then we show up at this really fancy restaurant. Gina set up this dinner. They have a prefix menu. All the girls are very excited about uh they're like ooh, this is like the bachelor i love that that's like good like ooh, the bachelor like that's this feels it feels like a group date nice anyways we cut to shannon bedore in a car and shannon's like do you know that apparently i cannot go to mexico for 10 years with the dui and vicky vicky gunvalson victoria is in the car with her and vicky loves mexico and vicky's like well maybe you can go to san diego and then you cross over the border Shannon's like, okay. I love that Vicky's encouraging, like, uh, you know, she's like, maybe we'll build a tunnel and we'll tunnel you into Mexico. Like, I think that's great. You know, I can't do it because I have a leakage problem with my pus, but maybe we, I love that Vicky's encouraging her <laughs> to, to, to go against <laughs> like, also who knew, like, you can't go with a DUI. You can't go to Mexico for 10 years. Who anyways, Vicky goes, Shannon says, I'm not excited about sitting at a dinner table dinner table with Alexis and uh, Tamara. Vicky goes, I'll come visit you in Tijuana jail if you get busted. And they're talking to Shannon goes, I know that Vicky will have my back and that she'll support me. And then Vicky tells Shannon, are we whooping it up tonight? 
Vicky loves to whoop it up. It helps her love tank. It helps her digestion, everything. And Shannon's like, no, we're not. No, we, we're not. And then Vicky goes, we can whoop it up without alcohol. Can we, Vicky? Can we? Anyways, Cammy Sue and Lexi come in and they're together like, wow, this place is crazy. Wow. All right. Anyways, in Gina's talking head, she's wearing the same outfit. Uh, Alexi is wearing the same outfit as Gina. And in this talking head outfit, Gina looks great. And Gina's like, this bitch is wearing my dress. Sorry, it's Tamara, actually. That Not Lexi, Tamara. This bitch is wearing my same outfit, and she's got bigger boobs than me. It's fucking bullshit. I still think I wore it better. I do, too, actually, Gina. Anyways, Lexi is very excited to be there. She's like already on fire. Like, hey, I'm in a scene. Woo, woo. I wasn't at the golf event. So she's hugging everybody. Very excited. Heather's there like going, let's put Alexis over here. And Lexi's like, I love when somebody tells me where to sit. I love that Heather's kind of also looking out for Shannon. Like, let's make sure, you know, because Shannon and Vicky are the last people to arrive, which is on purpose. They set up call times for these things. And they know it has the best dramatic effect for Vicky and Shannon to come in last. Heather and talking head goes, listen, you know I like a seating chart and place cards. And if no other night it was needed tonight, it is needed. I have called the paparazzi to get a shot of me sitting. No. Anyways, Emily goes, it's very difficult to, to seat everyone because you have to remember where everyone's at. You can't put Shannon next to Alexis. Katie can't sit by Heather. I guess I can't sit by Heather, Gina says. Emily and Jen can't sit next to each other. She called me a squatter, Katie says. It's like everyone, it's like a spider web of conflict. Once again, Katie, welcome to the housewives. So Ta Tammy Sue tells Katie, I'm so confused on all the paparazzi stuff, Katie. And Katie goes, Gina and I discussed it. I told her I felt like I was kind of like sidelined a little bit, you know, you know, left out in the dirt and cam camera's like uh, an island by yourself. And it, it hurt me a lot, Katie says, because it's my good, dear friend. I'm rethinking a lot. You know what I mean? And Tamara's just taking in this information. It's a concerned look on her face, but she's just taking mental notes to use against Katie at some other opportune moment. That's how Tamara seems to operate on these shows. And once again, when Katie's revealing any of this, I'm like, Katie, don't, don't waste your breath with Tamara. It will and can be used against you. It's like just fair game. I also like Tam Tamara going like, I'm just so confused about this paparazzi stuff. No, you're, why, what? No, you're not. Anyways, Tamara orders an espresso martini. Shouldn't we be watching what we drink, Tamara? Uh, Katie orders a super dirty Grey Goose martini. So everybody's drinking. Everybody's drinking. They look at Emily's new ring from the engagement. And... Emily goes, yeah, I got a new ring for my engagement. And Lex Alexis... Seems like she's on all the Red Bulls. Goes, what? What? And she grabs Emily's hand like a, the Hulk. Just like Hulk's her too. Or like, what? What? You did? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Look at it. Oh, my God. It's beautiful. Oh, my God. And Emily goes, yeah, we go to dinner for our anniversary. I pull out this photo, this sexy photo. It's this big, the boudoir photographer, right? And we flash back to the end of that night where Shane is showing this framed photo of Emily to just passerbys on the street. And then Tamara goes, yeah, in between slices of pizza, he keeps looking at that photo. Hell yeah, he is. Jane Big Johnson uh, Simpson. So Lexi, uh, Alexis, asks Katie about, what was that thought process about leaving me out of the golf event? What was the thought process? Of that? I'm like, Alexis, you're going too hard, man. So Katie goes, I got to know Shannon a little bit, Alexis. And I thought like, let me give her a day when I'm getting to know these girls where she doesn't have to feel like she's underwater, you know? And Tamara goes, but you guys have to understand where Alexis is coming from. She's kind of feeling like Shannon's trying to get to everybody to try to get Alexis out of there. And Alexis is like, it's just not fair. It's just not fair. It's just not fair. Oh, first off, Shannon really hasn't done that. Shannon's like prefer would would prefer not to. She's been open about that, but she has not like turned the screws. Also, Katie was being a good friend. And yes, it makes a lot of sense. But like, it's not fair. Alexis, you have come into her house at this point. You have. And you have to realize you are a friend of. This is not the Alexis season. You have to realize you are kind of a pawn, you know, against Shannon. And, you know, you're not going to garner a lot of empathy and sympathy when it involves Johnny Bador. 
anyways, there's like, is Shannon coming tonight? And Gina's like, she's supposed to be coming. And at this moment, Shannon and Vicky come in and it's their, their <laughs> table is like hidden. Like there's like a, like one of those bookshelves, like a hidden door. And Vicky and Shannon, you like, they've never seen anything like this in their lives. They're like, oh my God, stop it. Behind the bookcase. Oh my God. The technology is this is Elon Musk. What is this? Anyways, they come in and everybody's like, Victoria, it's Queen Victoria. And Tammy goes, Oh God, the wicked witch of the West. And I'm talking to Ed, Tammy goes, I'm not surprised that Shannon brought Vicky because she needs backup. Yeah, she does. She needs a fucking friend, Tamara. I like, and I love that they didn't tell Tamara that Vicky was coming. So Tamara's face is like, Oh, Vic, Vic, Vicky's here. Anyways, Katie gets to meet Vicky. Shannon and talking to goes, she wants people to do her dirty work so she can sit there and look like the victim. Oh, me? Oh, oh, gross, Tamara, gross. And also, it's not somebody else doing their dirty work. Can't we actually have people that just help us and support us? It's not like sometimes people just need a friend. It's not some like big game. Like you treat everything, Tamara. Like it's such a bummer. Tamara, you, Tamara, if you're listening, like, you don't have to do this. You don't, where's the softer side? <laughs> Come on, where's the, <laughs> I feel like Carl with Lindsay Hubbard. Can I get a hug? Tamara, can I get a hug? Can we be softer? Can we? I swear to God. You, you, by the way, this is what we're talking about. If you went to the softer side, if you turned from a villain to a hero and it's been done on Housewives before, I think you'd be celebrated. It's like a different color. It's like Daniel Day Lewis playing a different role. Like, oh my God, look at the range. Tamara, look at that. We need to see your range. Anyways, Alexis sees Vicky and goes, look who's in my world now. <laughs> hey, chill it. Chill, Lexi. Chill. You're a friend of like, oh my God. Oh my God. She's just laughing. <laughs> but we do flash back to the scene of Alexis and Jim Bellino where they met for the first time. And Vicky, I think it was at like the lingerie place. And Vicky's like, welcome to my world. <laughs> so I guess Lexis is, you know, playing off of that. I just didn't find it that funny. And Vicky goes, you're in my world now? I was like, whoa, uh, whoa, sit down, bitch. I love that Vicky already says sit down, bitch, because it's very funny because Vicky then has makes a big impassioned speech about how what women should be treating each other. But she's like, sit down, bitch. In a talking head, Vicky's like, what's wrong with this woman? She sued Tamara, and now you want to be friends with her? She's gone Lulu, Looney Tunes. She's got Cuckoo Bird. Girl's nuts. Girl's nuts. Remember, two things can be true at once, folks. Anyways, the guy goes to order cocktails and Vicky goes, you can have a cocktail, Shannon. You're not driving. I give you permission. And Tamara looks at this with the most judgmental, gross face. And Shannon, you know, quietly orders a Belvedere soda with a lemon, please. And Tamara's clocking all of this. Tamara's like clocked in. And Vicky's like, you can have a drink. You can have, you're not driving. And that's true. You're not driving. Would we like Shannon to not have any drinks? Sure. But I'm sorry, this kind of situation drives people to drink. Now, I would have liked this to actually have gone on more than what it explodes into in a second, where we could have seen if Shannon stopped at one or two, you know, or if she got obliterated. And the fact that Tamara pops off immediately, Tamara should have played the long game and really seen if Shannon hung herself that night. Or maybe Tamara was afraid to give Shannon that opportunity because maybe Shannon wouldn't have gotten blotto. Who knows? We'll never know. So Vicky's like, you're not driving. And Shannon's like, I, 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 I'm aware. I'm aware. And then Tamara goes, oh, yeah, an alcoholic should drink. Yeah, yeah. Which, by the way, when she says this, she's drinking an espresso martini. And I'm sorry. Tamara seems a little loose. You know what I'm saying? She seems like she's had a couple. And Vicky clocks Tamara saying this. And it's just silence. And we see a lot of reaction shots. This whole scene, you guys, is like reaction shots. It's like, duh. And then we see Alexis's face like, zoiks. And then we go to Katie. And Katie's face is like, zoiks. And then we go to Gina's face. And Gina's like, I'm in real estate, zoiks. And then we go to Emily and zoiks. And Tamara's like, I'm going to kill you. And there's just silence. And Vicky goes, she can have alcohol, Tamara. She just can't go behind the wheel ever, ever, ever. And we're going to tunnel her into Tijuana. She can't do it ever, ever, ever. And Tamara goes, do you truly believe she doesn't have a drinking problem? Shannon goes, you have been on this path for 10 years with me. Everybody has, Tamara screams. Everybody has. 
And then we get tense music, more of the face, more of the faces, zoiks, zoiks, zoiks. And then Shannon, thank, like, I love Shannon went to bat for herself. And Shannon goes, who made you the judge and jury of what my sentence is? Because let me tell you something. Every freaking day that I wake up, I think about what happened. And then Tamara goes, is that after you have a drink? And then more zoinks, 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 just reaction shots. This last scene, like I said, it's like five minutes of reaction shots. But I'm sorry, that Tamara saying, is that after you have a drink, is one of the more disgusting moments in Housewives history. And I know that's potentially the name of the game, and we're talking about it, and it's, you know, but it's gross. And it just shows you there is no friendship there. No, no fake friends, man. There is no friendship there. It is gross. And if you really, truly believe Shannon had a very big drinking problem, you would, I would hope, treat it with more class and respect than you do. It is so trashy to me. Yeah, it's trash. It's very trashy to me. But then we could just keep getting more reaction. I felt like I was going to watch three minutes of reaction shots. I was like, and then we cut the commercial and we come back and we literally come back to more reaction shots. Oh, who? And we replay the last three lines that we just saw. Why do they do this? Are they just pressed like we need to fill like so much time? Like, why do we like how how do how would they think that they w- we would forget the last three lines during a commercial break? Like, oh, what I'm I've completely blacked out. What, where were we? Anyways, we repeat three lines back to reaction shots. And Emily goes, you know what? All right. Honestly, I think Shannon's changed. I'm sorry. You can get mad at me, but I do. And Tamara goes, no, I'm not mad at you. And just goes to show you, like, Emily, like, you can be mad at me. In what world would Tamara ever have a right to be mad at Emily for standing up for Shannon when she needs people to stand up for her? Emily goes, I do think she's changed. And Gina goes, I think she's doing a good job. You know, and Emily's like, yeah, no, you know, she, uh, you know, everything's good. She's getting better. And she's like, yeah, I I feel that I do. But I understand why it's hard for you, Tamara. I get it. But I don't think this is the way to get what you're looking for, Tamara. Tamara's looking just for Shannon destruction. In a talking head, Gina goes, it's not for Tamara to decide if Shannon is an alcoholic, which by the way, it's that horrible outfit that Gina has been wearing in the, the new outfit in the talking head. So she's saying something like dead on right. But I was just so distracted by this outfit. She goes, it is not for Tamara to berate her and make her feel worse than she already feels. You know, she's supposed to be her friend. So I don't get this behavior at all. I don't. In the scene, Anna goes, okay, you know what, Tamara? Let's look at your drinking. You went dead weight at Nobu last year. And Tamara's like, no, I didn't. No, you have had to have people sit in a car with you, Tamara. And Tamara goes, so what? There's a big difference between drinking and having a good time and being an alcoholic. She's screeching. She's doing the Tamara screech. That's my opinion screech. Now the dinner gets brought out because it's a prefix menu, right? And they start drink, like they start awkwardly eating, which is so funny. But Tamara, like, yeah, you did go dead weight at Nobu. Remember? Remember when you became unhinged? Like, that wasn't a good time. I remember that episode. That was dark. Yeah, it was embarrassing. You've had moments too. And I'm not saying that Shannon doesn't have a problem with alcohol, but there's got to be a better way. There's got to be a better way to discuss this. Gina asks Vicky, how do you, how do you feel about all this, Vicky, between them? And Vicky goes, I, 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 I think it's disgusting because a friend's a friend. Tamara's like, what's disgusting? Well, the whole fighting, the whole fighting thing. Emily goes, but Vicky, I see you fight all the time. I, I see you post things about her. She posted something about traitors. And we flash to the screen where Tamara, remember, was like kicked out very early on the season of traitors. And Tamara says, you don't want to miss this. Three weeks out from hashtag the traitors US season two premiere. And Vicky tweeted back, perfect show for you. <laughs> and Vicky goes, because what happened, she traded. Because what happened, she traded. She did, she traded. <laughs> and <laughs> Tamara goes, I'm not a trader. I'm a faithful. God, you, uh, you, uh, you weren't even good on that show. You got kicked out pretty much immediately. I'm not a faithful. I'm a tra- you play this, like I said, you pl- Tamara plays this game like it is a competition reality show. And he was like, I'm a faithful. I just decided to vote you two out. Lame. Can we get all like, I just said, anyways, Tamara goes, I didn't feel comfortable doing the show because Shannon just crashed her car into a house drunk. 
he needed to go to rehab. And because she did, she went to a therapy to figure out why she takes bad guys. And Shannon at this point gets up and Alexis laughs like, oh, and Shannon goes, this has to stop. I've had two conversations with you on the telephone. And Tamara goes, and you were drunk every time. More reaction shots. Zoik, zoik, zoik. Shannon goes, I couldn't drink in my program. You need to stop. And then Tamara goes, lie, 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 lie. And she's pounding on a desk like she's some lame-ass Judge Ito. Lie, lie, lie. That's all you fucking do. Shannon goes, you need to stop. I need to stop what? Uncovering your bullshit? How you had to pay for everything for John. At the beginning, I did, Tamara. But you owe him $70,000. And then Lexi pops in, 75, 75, Tammy. 75. More reaction shots. Heather DeBro's mouth is open. Gina zoiks. Everybody zoiks. And then Emily's like, wait, I don't understand. Why does Shannon owe money? And now Shannon is trying to escape the room. She's trying to open the hidden bookshelf. Like, let me, let me out. And Lexus starts, you know, talking to Emily. Well, it, she owes him for a facelift and a loan. And Shannon goes, we know you've been coached, Alexis. And then Lexi's like, do you want receipts? Because I'll prove it. I have a phone. And Shannon goes, because he's giving them all to you. And then Lexis is like, I have the wire transfers right here on my phone if anyone wants to see it. It's right here. And Shannon leaves unfucking believable. It really is. It's like that scene in Empire of the Strikes Back when they're at that Lando Calrissian place in Cloud City and like Luke Skywalker and Han Solo and Chewie, all the gangs there. And then uh, they go to the dinner and Darth Vader's there and, and they realize they've been set up. This is what that feels like. And Tamara's Darth Vader. And it's like just a big setup. It's big setup. Anyways, Lexus is like, liar face is going to be called out. And Emily goes, she's liar, liar, spanks on fire. Emily, please don't. Please don't. Not now. And Shannon outside is like, John Jansen is giving her receipts? I love that she's just saying this in public, like everybody's enjoying their dinner. <laughs> and you see an activated Shannon Bedore going, John Jansen's giving her receipt? So back in the uh, room, Lexus is showing everybody the receipt. And Gina's like, it's an actual receipt. One facelift, 75,000. Like, I didn't even know they had receipts. And also, is this legal? Are we allowed to be showing facelift receipts? Katie goes, was it a gift or a loan? And Alexa says they were loans. One is the facelift and the other is just because Shannon needed money and he was generous enough to give her the money. And Jen goes, I didn't even know she had a facelift. And Katie goes, she looks great. I love it. I didn't even know she had a facelift. She looks great. <laughs> I love that. but. Listen, at the end of the day, John Johnny J did not have a contract with Shannon about this money. So loan, blah, blah, blah. This is something they should work out away from the show. And now it's part of a court case. Shannon offered to pay and John says, no, I wanted it to go to court, which is so weird and gross. And why now of all times? Because it is like, you know, everybody thinks John Jansen's reputation is trying to be ruined. I'm sorry. It's Shannon Bedore's reputation that's been trying to be ruined by these people. And that's why it's so gross that Tamara's a part of this. Anyways, Vicky pops up and goes, Alexis, why are you involved in John's money with Shannon? And Alexis says, my boyfriend's reputation has been demolished. You've been fed by Shannon. You don't know the truth. Let me tell you. Let me tell you the truth. And Vicky's like, you're hearing it from John. And Alexis is like, you've been lied to. And I'm telling you right now, there's a lot more. And if she wants to go toe to toe, I'm ready. And she's like making a lot of hand movements. I'm ready. Ooh, ooh, ooh. And at this point, Jen Padronti goes out to check on Shannon, which I wish more people had gone to check out on Shannon, but Jen does. And we go to a talking head and Alexis looks so self-satisfied and smug. And the producer says, you know, why are you confident in John Jansen is telling you the truth? And Alexis, you know, just high on love is like, I'm confident in everything John says because I've watched his actions and we're together 24 seven. They formed this opinion by Shannon calling these other women late at night, drunk, <laughs> telling them horrible stories about John, which nothing has been true and couldn't be further from the truth. <laughs> Vicky says, he's not a victim. He's not a victim. You're trying to protect him. You don't need to protect him, Alexis. Sorry, I had to pause because I started choking on my anger. Um, so Lexus is like, I'm done. I'm done. It's just done. But the thing is like John's reputation being ruined with who the housewives, who the fuck cares what Emily and Gina think about John Jansen. John needs to mind his own business and go have his own friends in his own life. 
Like, I don't think a lot of people probably hangs out with watches the housewives. Why does John want to be a star? Why does John want to be involved in this group of people? It's so weird. It really is. And Alexis is so deep in it and deep in love that she doesn't even realize how weird this is. It's just weird. And the fact that she can't understand that it's extremely hurtful. I'm sorry. Like, why is your goal to like, like to, to, to try to help John Jansen's sullied name? Like, that's ridiculous. It's supposed to be stories about women. Like, what's your story, Alexis? I don't need a John Jensen redemption season when he's not a part of this show anymore. He barely was before. Anyways, Jenna went to, you know, check on Shannon. But Alexis says one more thing. goes, he's a victim? John has never acted like a victim. Oh, yeah, he is. You're treating him like a victim, Alexis, saying his reputation has been ruined. That is a victim. Anyways, Shannon is by herself in a corner. <laughs> it looks like in misery. And Jen comes up to her and Jen's like, hi. And Jen goes, it really hurts my feelings that nobody came out to see if I was okay. You know, and Jen goes, there's a lot of talk in there right now. Alexis and Tamara are showing wire transfers or something. And Shannon goes, yeah, okay. And Jen goes, a total is $75,000. And Shannon goes, oh, okay. By the way, it's $65,000. He gave me 30,000. He gave me 35,000. In a talking head. And it goes, Alexis has photographs of canceled checks. I mean, she thinks she's on Dateline and she's going to nail me for something. It's a very serious world in Orange County. It's me, Keith Morrison for Dateline. <laughs> I love it. Shannon goes, he's saying I owe him money, Jen. Cause you know why? Cause he's spending too much right now. That's probably true. He's probably like wine and a dine in Alexis and probably needs that 75,000. Shannon goes, you have receipts, Alexis. You should start saving yours in case it doesn't work out. Woo! Shannon goes, I just, I hate this, Jen. Jenna, I can only imagine that you do. I hate this, Jen. I got my ex-boyfriend's girlfriend. Jenna goes, I cannot imagine that he coached yet again. He's not, he's a fucking monster. He always said, I'm a good guy. I don't deserve this. Oh, John, what I could say, she says in a talking head, what I could release. Release the dragons. Shannon tells Jan, you have no idea the story about John Jansen. You have no idea. The story about Johnny Jansen. Uh, giving money for facelifts and stuff. And now he's boinking Alexis until the sun comes up. But she says, he's a fucking monster, Jan. Jen, he's a fucking monster. And the producer asks Shannon in a talking head, what don't we know about John Jansen? What, what? Shannon goes, yeah, you see, yeah, and you think that's not going to have him file a lawsuit against me if I say that? All I've ever said is the truth about John. In the scene, says, I'm going to go, or Vicky now says, I'm going to go find Shannon. So Vicky gets up to go find Shannon, and Tamara makes a beeline for Vicky and goes, it wasn't you, Tamara. It wasn't, sorry, it wasn't you, Vicky, and your pus-filled belly. Why I backed out of Trace Amigas. It wasn't you. It was her. And Vicky, this is why I love Vicky. Vicky goes, that girl needs a hug and needs to be said, you're going to be okay. And your DUI is not the label on you for the rest of your life. And you'll be able to tunnel to Tijuana if you need to. And the Tamara goes, you're enabling her. I'm not enabling her. I don't get, I didn't give her a bottle, but she needs help. Tamara says. Okay. This is where it's a little bit of a murky, you know, like, okay, needs help. She also needs friends. But she's also doing what she's court ordered to do. What I mean, what what help is like, I feel like it's a flimsy thing to hang your hat on. Like what kind of, you think she needs to be in a mental health facility? What do you think? She needs to rehab? Like what? Uh, come on. You know, come out with it. Anyways, Tamara goes, I'm not going to enable Shannon because I'm that type of friend. I'm not going to be the person that allows you to drink and doesn't hold you accountable. So what, next time you actually kill somebody? Stop fucking drinking, get help, or I'm done with this relationship. You're already done with this relationship. Why would Shannon want you back as a friend? You've not made any inroads to actually say that you're still her friend, but you need to do this. Nothing. You've just used her as a storyline. You've said some of the nastiest things that a housewife can say to another housewife. And then you're then trying to hang it on some moral superiority of like, da, 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 da. Like, listen, I get it. The drunk driving, horrible. Really? Thank God she didn't kill somebody. And then you move on, you pay your price. And God, if you don't think Shannon's paying a price, what show are you watching? And you're part of her punishment. But you can't keep referring to yourself as some type of friend because you're just not. 
back in the uh the the Shannon scene, Jen goes, you know, everybody's talking in there, and Shannon's like, I'm not going back. I'm not going back. No fucking way. I'm out. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. no, no. Then back in the scene, Alexis goes, I won't deal with liar face anymore. She's poking a bear. First she poked him, but now she's poking me. And also John Jansen would be poking you four times a night up top. Anyways, she goes, liar face, better, shush it. I think we can get a better nickname than liar face. Lexi, what do you, come on. Like you, you, you gave yourself a, a Lexi name. We can do better than liar face. Ooh, liar facelift, liar facelift face. How about that? That just came off the top of my head. Liar face, lift face, better shush it. And Heather's just taking this all in going, hmm. Because Heather, I mean, I would love to ask Heather about this scene because Heather, you know, it's like, oh, geez, this is rough stuff, you know, rough stuff. And Gina's kind of just watching in silence. It's dark. Emily says, you know, I do think Alexis does herself a big disservice being so aggressive towards Shannon. Let these girls get to know you as you, as Alexis, and not as John's defender. Bingo, Emily. Bingo. She nails it. Heather goes, I personally, and maybe you don't agree, and that's okay, Alexis, maybe keeping it and taking it down so that perhaps you become friends with Shannon. Alexis goes, here's all I know. I love the Lord. I've got Jesus juggies. No, she goes, I want to get to know her and like her for her. Emily goes, you can't say that and bring receipts at the same time. And... <laughs> Alexis goes, yes, I can. And then Tamara shrieks, why can't she? Tamara, God, God. And then Alexis stands up and goes, if you're going to fucking lie about my guy, no, if you're going to lie about my guess what? Guess what? I have more receipts and they'll come also. I'm leaving. I love you. I'm leaving. And now Alexis leaves. You should be Dr. Paycheck when you leave. Shannon as well. I'll say it. It's, it's both. You, you can't, you got to clock in. And Alexis, especially you, you're not even invited that. You're a friend that you can't. You, you know, if you want this as a recurring gig, you got to stay, man. And Emily goes, you can't say you want to be friends with someone and work someone out, work something out and then bring receipts at the same time. That's all I'm saying. That's common sense. Emily's right. You're just going to whip that out of dinner and then be like, oh, I hope we can hang out later. Would you like to come over? It's humiliating. It's embarrassing. What other intent is there? Exactly. Emily, thank you. It's redonkulous. Oh my God. It's thundering. I got so angry doing this recap that I, I, I think I've manifested thunder in Arizona. Anyways, Vicky's like, listen, I don't really want to sit. I'm getting ready to leave, girls. All I want you guys to know is this is toxic to me. It really is. You have to be kind. Humans need to do that, especially when we're women of faith and we want the best for each other. And I know you believe in Jesus Christ. She's a believer. You're a believer. We all are. We don't treat people this way. Heather goes, I mean, Vicky giving a speech about how disgusting all of this is. That's rich. Emily's like, you all are disgusting women. All of you, you're all disgusting. Imitating Vicky. Please show flashbacks of Vicky being disgusting now. And then, of course, they do. You have a little family man. When do you ever bring a family man to pick up six people? Why are you sending a family man? And then another scene where Vicky's going, fucking slut. I've never conned anyone in my life. Really? Fuck off. It's a great Vicky montage of intensity. Emily goes, we should all be good Christians and love one another and support women and buy her insurance. I'm here for it. <laughs> Vicky goes, have some compassion. That's it. And Tamara goes, I did for 10 years. And Vicky goes, it's never okay to drink and drive. What I'm saying is this is icky. This is not the way we treat women. We be there for women. Tamara goes, she needs to be in a rehab program. You don't get to determine that, Vicky. Yes, she does. She's a fucking alcoholic and she needs a rehab program. You really need to stop, Tamara. You're enabling her. And uh, Heather's like, what the fuck are they talking about? I mean, what is, you know, and everybody's like, I mean, you know, Shannon does look better though. They're like, Shannon does look good. Tamara goes, I'm not drinking. I'm not talking about drinking or driving. When you're an alcoholic, you should not drink at all. Vicky goes, you guys, just tone it down. And uh, how mean you are. I love you all. <laughs> I love you all. And then, then, then Vicky kind of finds the hidden bookshelf and like saunters out. And then Katie goes, this dinner was amazing. Thank you so much. You know, and, and Gina's like, I honestly thought this was going to bring everybody together. But uh, I guess we're on the Real Housewives, you know? Oh, you guys. And then it's next time on the Real Housewives of Orange County. And we see them dressed in like bear costumes, like cameras eating food off somebody's toe. 
half the group is in La Quinta, half the group is in Big Bear because they can't like be on vacation together. So we see like activities like snow. I don't know. Tamara is talking to Katie, going, Gina encouraged you to out Heather. You got set up, which I don't agree with at all. But of course, that's Tamara just causing more mess. And then we have a scene of Heather talking to Gina. Heather goes, I feel betrayed by you. And Gina taking that in. And then Shannon talking to Gina going, I got a letter saying you owe John Jansen $75,000. And then a scene of Alexis going, do I need to pull out the videos? Johnny's ready to talk. And the girls are like, wow. Oh my God. Hi, this is John Jansen. I am ready to talk against Shannon Bedore. Oh my God. This show is infuriating, but my God, do I love it. What an episode. <laughs> what an episode. Oh, you guys, we did it. We came to the end. Also, I love Vicky saying in the name of Jesus, Christ, you're a believer. You're a believer. Yeah. Isn't that true? Like Tamara, remember when she had that religious conversion, she got baptized and stuff. What? I mean, you know, listen, I don't know a lot about Christianity anymore, but I mean, it, I feel like this goes against a lot of like, in terms of like loving uh, your fellow man or woman, but may, also maybe Jesus Christ should be like a friend of this season. And like, it is I, Tamara, shut the fuck up, please. <laughs> you guys. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this supersized Orange County recap where we talked a little bit of Vanderpump Rules and all that stuff. Also, the Patreon, uh, I'm late on the Vanderpump Rules Season 1, Episode 4 recap, so that'll be out tomorrow on Sunday. I'm going to drive back to L.A. tonight, and then I'll do that tomorrow and then meet us bright and early on Monday for an all-new pop culture roundup, and uh, I hope you have a great rest of your weekend. Bye!